What's good ladies and gentlemen, welcome to part 2 of what if Niji Hayuga breaks the seal of fate, destroys Hayuga clan in this episode, we are continuing to follow the life of Hayuga Niji, as he tries to break free from his destiny, so support him by giving the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and comment below for the next part. With that, guys, enjoy. On top of the forested hill, another fierce battle was simultaneously raging on between two very powerful individuals on this hot day. Ayasu, the samurai lord, employed his twin style Lido, channeling many chakra flashes forward, onto his opponent, Mike Guy, also somehow mixing wind release into the attacks. From the moment this battle started, it was in a kind of stalemate. That Ayasu's secret attack from his clan, he performed, didn't simply employ the so-called wind release nature transformation from the ninja world at all, instead. It used the wind, which was already all around in the atmosphere, with a secret Kenjutsu method picking up and sharpening the wind with his channel chakra flashes along their trajectory towards their opponent, making those ordinary channels many times stronger. It was also the same move his two servants used in battle. His clan's base style of Kenjutsu was called Lido. It was a style concerned with the smooth, controlled movements of drawing the sword from its scabbard, striking or cutting an opponent, removing blood from the blade, and then replacing the sword in the scabbard. The linear motion and force applied to draw the sword from the scabbard results in slashes that are faster and stronger than ones executed with the sword already drawn. It could be also said to be called a Batajutsu. However, he was different from most users of this style, as he used twin swords instead. He could not just strike his opponents up close with it, but he could even channel chakra outside his swords, and mix it with the wind outside and he could do it in really quick endless succession. Mike Guy used a barrage of fast punches to parry, which were so fast that they were set ablaze by sheer speed and friction. Guy was still in his sixth gate, but by the looks of it, it won't be enough. Mike Guy, you are quite amazing. You don't even use those filthy ninjutsu powers for such strength. I acknowledge you. You are the strongest shinobi I have ever fought. Ayasu, who was in a frenzy of drawing and then putting back his swords, suddenly shouted a little excitedly towards Guy. It was truly his first time seeing pure physical strikes could be made that way. Moreover, with all his knowledge from the Land of Iron, he had no idea, at the present, to determine how the man in front of him did it. Nor why was he so strong physically overall, and what was up with his strange aura and appearance. He could just attribute it to the outside world being more mysterious than the previously thought. He immediately realized that he underestimated this man in front of him, the Blue Beast, the Konohagaka, and even the whole ninja world. But there is no backing off now. However, I can't lose to you. I still need to get back what is rightfully mine in the Land of Iron. I really underestimated him to think I have to use this trick I prepared for Mifun on someone else. Immediately after shouting that, Ayasu suddenly stopped drawing and attacking with his swords. Secret Sword. Twins were Tornado. It was a technique of his clan when the user while focusing their chakra into their twin swords while they were still sheathed, performs a Batajutsu strike. From this, the user unleashes a powerful shockwave which becomes a massive chakra and wind tornado surrounding them, repelling everything in the area near the user. Powerful as the technique is, it is not without drawbacks. It takes time and focuses to unleash the technique. It is also very chakra taxing, making it only usable once in a given day. Finally, the technique is also potentially dangerous to the user, as loss of control can potentially cause as much harm to the user as all the other targets. It's good, I plan to end this as well and go back to my disciples. Mike Guy looked at the massive tornado forming, without any fear. He even felt a trace of respect for any man who could do an attack of that scale. Without using any ninjutsu, he must have trained day and night for decades in order to perform this. Then I won't disappoint you. Seventh Gate. Gate of Wonder. Located below the stomach, the opening of this gate causes the user's body to secrete a blue sweat. The sweat immediately evaporates, creating an aura around the user that can be mistaken for chakra. It was best used for Guy's signature move called Hiridora. In the next second, it came out. To make this move, the user places a palm facing forward in front of their face with one hand, and then taps it with his other hand, formed into a fist, which creates a massive amount of air pressure. Next, the user forms a unique hand seal resembling a tiger. This launches the air pressure at the opponent in the shape of one, by leaving a gigantic tiger-shaped impression into the initially built-up air pressure with the hand seal. The air pressure will condense as it's moving and be focused into a single point. The technique then explodes on command, releasing the built-up air pressure in an instant. Quickly, the giant intimidating white tiger 
jumped in front of the giant blue shark tornado. Nu, no. after a few more seconds, a fascinating scene suddenly unfolded. Guy's white tiger managed to bite off and chew onto the tornado, breaking its defenses, and then bursting out. And, in his few last seconds, Ayasu's whole life flashed in front of his eyes. Training for decades to defeat the legendary genius Mifun, who unexpectedly overtook his clan's rule over the land of iron. He was once in a century genius, gathering common people and overthrowing his clan's rule. Their centuries of rule over his destined throne overtaken when he was young. He vowed to get it back. And now when he felt like he had a good shot to take down Mifune, while he was on his mission to gather enough funds and bribe some of Mifune's supporters, he died crazily like this. Kinoha's hospital is one of the largest buildings currently inside the Konohagaka. It got three to four different floors, spacious rooms, and hallways full of all kinds of medical equipment and medical ninja. The hospital serves the medical needs of ninja and other villages in Konohagaka. Inside one of the top grade private rooms on the highest floor, there was a white elegant bed in which laid a teenager with long black hair, scattered all over his pillow, while slowly opening his white eyes. The other two teenagers in the room also quickly opened their tired eyes and exclaimed at that same time. Those were Tenten and Rock Lee who accompanied Niji during the whole time he was asleep. They were sitting on chairs near his bed, and leaning onto it tiredly with their arms. Niji, you finally woke up. Rock Lee jumped in joy while also having a little complicated look in his eyes, while Tenton looked like she wanted to rush and hug him hard, but in the end, still held back. How long was I sleeping? Niji nodded a little and immediately asked in his usual composed tone. More than a whole day passed already, Niji. Tenton answered softly, with a worried but relieved look. That's good. It seems that his body wasn't too weak, and all those hard body exercises paid off. Not to mention, that his body and chakra reserves would only get stronger with time. His body was currently still very young and underdeveloped, far from its peak potential that it would reach later. The nurse said that it was just a usual body exhaustion situation, but I was still very worried for you, Niji. Tenton continued speaking a little irritatedly. She wasn't back there with Niji and Lee. She was dealing with that group of ordinary bandits, while protecting Kanoha's merchants as tasked, when all of a sudden, a giant blue tornado, a giant white fist tiger, and then their sensei Guy carrying an unconscious Niji with Lee Kane. Her heart nearly stopped beating until Guy explained that Niji collapsed just due to his body exhaustion and that he wasn't injured anywhere. That whole thing left a really profound influence on her mind. First, it was her first time seeing movements of such scale. And second, when she learned that Niji used eight in the gates as well. What happened after I collapsed? Niji mainly wanted to know the result of Guy's own battle. Just a couple of minutes after you collapsed, Mike Guy defeated that strongest samurai with his move called Hiridora. He was shocked that you learned eight gates on your own, but said that you have a surprisingly strong body for a Hayuga and that your condition wasn't bad. But, he'll have a serious talk with you. Tenton explained seriously, while Rock Lee was clenching his fists a little. Tornado requiring Hiridora to defeat it. Is it that one move later from Baruto made using Sword Batajutsu? Didn't expect it to appear in this timeline. It seems that this truly is the real-like world. Niji wasn't all that surprised about Mike Guy defeating his opponent but he wasn't expecting it to require him to even use his signature Hiridoro in the seventh gate. If that's the case, that older samurai is probably around the middle cage level of strength, then what level is Mifune truly on? I really can't treat this world as the same one from a manga from my previous life. This is different. I'm still really far away from the peak players of this world. I must step up my game during the tune-in exams and acquire those things next. Niji's white eyes suddenly turned resolute and firm. My maximum is only a low cage level of strength right now, and that's only for a short period of time. It's obviously not enough. Niji also clenched his fists a little, but suddenly found Tenten and Lee having the same mood and looks in their eyes. But how far can you two really progress? Niji knew what he did was stimulating and earth-shattering for them, killing two full-fledged elite join-ins in a couple of seconds. But Niji knew that in this world, that was truly nothing worth of consideration. In fact, at 13 years of age, both Itachi and Shisui Achiha were stronger than him. At 13 years of age, with Manjekyo Sharingan, Itachi managed to solve Orochimaru, one of the legendary Sanin, with just one look in a second as well as killing hundreds of Achiha's strongest clansmen nearly all on his own. Abito, Danzo, and Hiruzen were all paying attention to him at that time and regarded him as their equal. At that time, Itachi should have already been late cage, in terms of strength in Niji's opinion, while Shisui should have been around the middle cage level of strength. While there was not much information on Shisui in his previous world, thanks to his awakened Manjekyo Sharingan, difficulty Kota Matsuyakami ability, and the international nickname received at only 9 years old, Shisui of the Body Flicker, 
Niji could only speculate he was just a step below. However, don't confuse it, Niji didn't admire them at all due to their strength. In fact, he even felt ridicule for them from the bottom of his heart. After all, one killed his own clan, family, and love while the other got his eyes dug out due to his stupidity. They were zero in Minset, naive peace-loving idiots. Strength is not everything in this world, as seen in how both of them got manipulated. Silence suddenly filled the room, and no one knew what each other thought about for a while then. However, Niji didn't guess presently the power the so-called butterfly effect that he created would bring to the lives of those two young people beside him in the future and where they would reach. Later, the conversation continued as usual, and Niji learned that it turned out that even Hiyashi visited him personally while he was asleep before in the hospital. As for why, Niji could only guess. Some time later on, inside the hospital's top floor hallways, two adults and three younger teenagers walked slowly ahead. One of the two adults had a bowl-like haircut and a green jumpsuit covering all of his body, alongside a smile on his face, while the other one had a similarly peculiar look on him. He had spiky silver hair oriented to his left side, dark grey eyes, and a lazy expression. He wore a formal Kanova Jonin uniform, consisting of a green flak jacket and dark blue pants. The first, and the most loud one, of the upcoming teenagers, wore an orange and blue jacket with a white collar, a white swirl with a tassel on the left side, and a distinctive crest on the back. He also wore orange pants with a shuriken holster on his right knee, blue sandals, and a blue forehead protector. But his most distinguishable features were his yellow blonde, spiky hair and blue eyes. Another male teenager walking there looked way more passive and calm than the blonde one. He wore a navy blue, short-sleeved shirt with a high collar, white shorts, and white arm warmers. He had black eyes and spiky black hair with a blue tint. His hair was long and hung over his face's bangs. And finally, there was a female teenager in the group too. She had fair skin, a pretty face, green eyes, and long pink hair. She wore a red kippow dress with slits along the sides, accompanied by a zipper and white circular designs. She also wore tight dark green bike shorts with a shuriken holster around her right thigh, blue sandals, and the standard Kanova forehead protector worn as a hairband. So, guy, you're finally willing to introduce your little disciples to me. How very late of you. Kakashi plainly exclaimed all of a sudden when walking beside Guy with a nonchalant and relaxed attitude. Well, well, now, Kakashi, you always said yourself that you weren't interested before. So, what changed so suddenly for you to ask me that? Mike Guy suddenly smirked a bit as he looked at his longtime friend of decades. He also casually glanced at Kakashi's own disciples knowingly for a bit. Mike Guy has considered Kakashi his rival ever since they first met in the Ninja Academy when they were kids. At first, Guy began striving to earn Kakashi's approval back there so as to show that his perseverance could be just as good as Kakashi's natural genius, despite him being the most excellent genius in Kanoda's history at the time. But in time, they developed a strong and close friendship, and Mike Guy's challenges toward Kakashi and their competitions became much less serious. Their competitions currently ranged from eating contests to rock, paper, scissors battles. Well, you're right. I wasn't interested before. But now, after hearing all of that, I simply must give them some motivation and clarity, comma. Kakashi thought while looking at his peculiar disciples in front. Even Kakashi couldn't believe it when he heard those rumors. A 13-year-old Hayuga clan member managed to kill two elite jonin level opponents all of his own in a matter of seconds. In fact, by now, those rumors circulated around the whole village. And as neither the Mike guy, the boy's sensei, nor the Hokage denied them, it seemed to be the truth. It was really earth-shattering. Even though Niji was always regarded as the leading genius in the new generation, nobody expected him to reach that level so quickly. This is just a level below those two Uchiha geniuses of the past. So, Kakashi quickly took this chance to broaden the horizons of his disciples with this crazy news. Sasuke was the most affected of them, while Naruto and Sakura didn't quite grasp the significance of it yet. Today was their team's day off, and after meeting with Mike Guy, he brought them all here, maybe after meeting him in person. That could change, not to mention even Kakashi was curious. After all, even him currently wasn't sure if he would be able to perform the same feat. Inside a particular hospital room, located on the top floor, a young teenager was gazing outside the window. It was still midday outside, and the sun was shining dazzlingly. He gazed outside to the nearby high trees, and many different kinds of birds coming and going, roaming freely outside. Rock Lee and Tenton surprisingly already left somewhere a little while ago. During their conversation, he found both of them behaving somewhat weirdly, and as if there was a lot on their minds as well. But by the end of it both of them seemed to reach some kind of conclusion already. He should be also leaving this hospital soon. The nurses were giving him some final medical tests. As he gazed melancholically at those flying birds, he imagined himself being so free one day as well. He also thought about many different plans that are crucial for his success, 
and his life in the future. But just then he heard a few unfamiliar voices coming from the outside toward his room. Kakashi Sensei, are we finally there? Is it this Niji guy's room? A blonde-haired Naruto Yuzumaki exclaimed exuberantly and a little impatiently all of a sudden. Beside him was Sasuke, who clenched his fist a little, and Sakura too who looked curious. Kakashi told Naruto to shut up a little, and then he looked as Mike Guy fiercely kicked off the door of Niji's room and vigorously stormed in. However, in the next moment, they were even more shocked. A previously fierce-looking Mike Guy suddenly broke in and started comically crying beside Niji's bed, while yelling his student's name. Even Niji had to forget about his strange and unexpected other visitors for a while, as his sweat dropped a little from the side in front, and then he stood up a little to lift the crying guy up, while saying annoyedly, All right, Guy-sensei, you previously said yourself, that it isn't nothing serious. However, suddenly, everyone in the room had their mouths open wide too, from the shock together with their previously comically opened eyes. It turned out that while Niji was lifting Mike Guy up, he suddenly got sucker punched so hard that he flew to the nearby wall, which now formed many cracks on it from the impact, nearly breaking apart. Even Kakashi was flabbergasted. You little bastard, when and how did you learn the eight inner gates technique? And why didn't you inform me, your sensei? Do you know how dangerous it is to use? Mike Guy suddenly stopped crying comically and then turned serious, changing his previous demeanor in an instant. Niji slowly stood up from the cracks in the wall, fixing his hurt jaw with his gente fist style a little. He was quite skilled in acupuncture and chiropractics in this life. He could quite easily dodge Guy's upcoming punch, thanks to his advanced precognition ability. But there was no point in doing that. He knew Guy did that out of concern for him, and that he should let him vent out a little after all. Calm down. Guy Sensei, I learned it a long time ago from us spas together. Did you forget the analytical powers of my eyes? Niji casually explained while pointing at his white eyes, now standing in front of the group of visitors. And as for why I didn't tell you, I simply wasn't feeling like it to be honest. And he wasn't lying, he really hated informing others of his abilities, even his closest people. Not to mention that he wouldn't use that at all if not for the situation being dangerous and calling for it. But, as you see, I could use it to the fourth gate perfectly with minimal side effects already, so you shouldn't be worried. Niji finished his explanation casually, apparently not giving it much care. He felt like he was right in this matter. He didn't eavesdrop when Guy was teaching Lee or anything of that sort. He simply created his own way of opening the inner gates and getting the same results as Guy and Lee from his dejutsu and creativity alone. That didn't break any of the ninja boundaries. He was looking Mike Guy straight in the eyes, while Guy was also seriously looking at him the same way. The situation turned quite tense in the room. Team 7 of Kanova started even sweating and gulping a little in apprehension, and even Kakashi turned a little serious at a time. However, all of a sudden, they were surprised all once again. When Mike Guy started laughing, of course Niji, you're much smarter than me, of course. You could integrate it with your gentle fist. And of course, you know your limits pretty well. Judging by how you knew exactly to which gate you could push in your battle against those two samurai. I was just a little hurt you didn't tell me. But just as Niji wanted to open his mouth and explain, Mike Guy surprisingly stopped him and added, I know, I know, that is probably how your personality is. No need to worry. I get it all. I just hope that you won't do anything in the future secretly against the team or the Kanoha. Of course, Sensei. Looking at the serious and understanding guy, Niji felt a little touched all of a sudden. He suddenly had even more respect for his sensei. He already regarded him as his closest. Looking at Niji's unexpected warm expression, Guy suddenly felt a rock falling off his chest. It seems that he didn't wander too far in extremism. I was right. He's truly my Mike Guy's disciple. Haha, <laughs> that's good, Niji. Here I have someone to introduce to you. This is my good old friend and biggest rival, Kakashi. And these are his disciples, you introduce yourself. Mike Guy smiled and finally returned to his old usual self. Team 7 also sighed in relief and started introducing themselves. Kakashi and Sakura were curious about Niji. While Naruto and Sasuke both introduced themselves in a little disrespectful way. Both informed him that they would be soon surpassing him. White Eyes, I heard about you from Kakashi-sensei. Remember this. My name is Naruto Yuzumaki. The man who will soon surpass all of you and become the next Hokage. Naruto confidently exclaimed while stepping forward and giving some kind of a challenging posture towards Niji. Niji Hayuga my name is Sasuke Chiha. I will be waiting for you at the Chunin exams. You're a worthy opponent, but I won't lose to anyone especially you. Sasuke stated slowly and seriously, in not so kind of a friendly way. He especially exaggerated the words Hayuga and Achiha, seemingly also paying attention to their clan's history of competition. He was very jealous of Niji's strength, he knew more than simple-minded Naruto, what kind of feat Niji accomplished just a while ago. He decided that he would train to failure next, until the Chunin exams, and defeat Niji there. He was even feeling envious and angry, not to mention, for a long time, 
He heard of Niji as a genius even bigger than him from the younger generation, and even possibly on the level of his hated elder brother Itachi. So, if he can't defeat even Niji Hayuga, then how will he deal with Itachi in the future? He must defeat him and resolve this inner demon as soon as possible. His gaze turned dark. Kakashi and Sakura turned to look at him in worry, while Mike Guy and Niji looked at him curiously. Niji especially was feeling extremely weird, now that he met characters from the manga of his previous life in this real life. Everything felt more real and complete than it was portrayed in that fantasy. So, he remained silent to both Naruto's and Sasuke's introductions, while thinking about something else after simply and dismissively replying to them, Niji Hayuga, nice to meet you all. Seeing this, Sasuke was even more agitated. Previously his team completed an A-level mission inside the Land of Waves, and he even felt a little proud of himself at that time. But that all went down the drain. Once he heard from Kakashi everything about Niji's mission, which could be even classified as an S-level. Not to mention, he and Naruto, in that state barely defeated one elite level Jonin, while Niji defeated two of them together. So, he had the right to be dismissive towards him. You believe it or not, it is none of my business. See you later at the Chunin exams. Sasuke furrowed his brows, weirdly humped, and suddenly went outside, feeling very agitated and shaken. Sasuke, seeing him in that state, both Naruto and Sakura, forgot about Niji and went to follow him outside. Sakura didn't have many thoughts about Niji, at this time as Sasuke was everything currently on her mind, while Naruto already felt like he said what he needed to say to Niji today. Kakashi suddenly mentally faced Panda little after seeing their behavior, but he felt like his purpose has been achieved. Sasuke and Naruto should at least work pretty hard now, and not take these upcoming Chunin exams lightly after they successfully accomplished that dangerous mission. Niji, I apologize for their behavior today. Wish you a good recovery, and good luck at the upcoming Chunin exams. Kakashi suddenly apologized to Niji and said goodbye to him and Guy. They both nodded knowingly, and he suddenly sprinted outside the room to catch up to his students. However, he also then started thinking about many things after seeing Niji himself. He would console Sasuke a little about how Niji was one year older than him, so as to not let him wander too far into a dangerous state of mind. He knew exactly what kind of person Sasuke was. In fact, Niji's feet even shook him a little bit. Not only his sensei might guy, but now he felt like even the man's young student Niji might surpass him if he already didn't. He was really stagnating too hard in his shinobi journey currently. He once again remembered what kind of genius his father once was, was I really right? Kakashi for the first time today wondered, was he right to abandon his father's way of fighting, his weapon? He also suddenly touched his covered left eye, Babito in fact, he couldn't truly admit it to himself yet but maybe this left eye also held him back too much. After, all the amount of chakra it consumes daily was monstrous, and he first stagnated right at the time he took it. Previously, he was always considered the biggest genius in Kanova's history. And after the visitors left, Mike Guy and Niji remained in the room alone, talking about many different things like the eight inner gates their previous mission, upcoming tune-in exams, etc. It was also soon time for the Niji to be discharged from the hospital, and they planned to train right away. Then, all of a sudden, both Niji and Mike Guy stood from their positions in a respectful way. A very old man suddenly knocked and came inside the room, and many Kanoha Ambu guards following him remained outside. He wore a distinctive and majestic red Hokage hat, with a white, full-length kimono, that is tied using a white sash. He also smoked a pipe as he casually strode in. He was a tan-skinned old man with a small goatee, and he had wrinkles and liver spots of old age. Lord Hokage. Both Niji and Mike Guy suddenly exclaimed respectfully as the old man walked in. Ho ho, is this the young Niji Hayuga? Are you feeling better? You really surprise us all. Hiruzen nodded toward Guy and kindly looked toward Niji and asked, Yes, Lord Hokage, it was nothing serious. Niji quickly, politely replied, but inwardly, he tried to find the reason for this strange visit. Hiruzen Saratobi was no doubt about it, a very interesting character in Niji's mind. He shielded the people that are close to him, a great deal, as seen with Orochimaru and Danzo. He loved the Kanoha enormously as well, but he also had a very dark side to him or else he wouldn't allow Danzo to commit all those atrocities of the past, or delegate him all that power in the first place. Was it because he was simply weak to Danzo's requests? Or he needed a scapegoat to keep his saint-like image in the hearts of the villagers, and soft power? But Niji still didn't fully know yet. Then the matter of how he was treating Naruto, giving him so little money that he would depend on others' pity to eat Raymond, or how he was drinking expired milk, with a father and mother like those two. That simply shouldn't have been the case. Where did his inheritance go? His sad and pitiful childhood was probably all set up by Hiruzen, so he could be his only light in the dark and easily manipulate him in that way. As for Awagaka's revenge because of Minato, it was comical. If Kanova couldn't defend their Jinchuriki and had to resort to hiding his identity like that, 
then they simply shouldn't call themselves a hidden village anymore. It clearly was a rubbish explanation in Niji's opinion. It's just that Hiruzen's plan was utterly stupid from Niji's point of view. Had Naruto not been an Ashura's Buddha-like soul reincarnation, Niji felt like Naruto would be the one to destroy the Kanoha and let them feel the pain, instead of Nagato, in that case. In Niji's mind, the only differences between Hiruzen and Danzo were the means for accomplishing different objectives, not the objectives themselves. Danzo also didn't have any affection, as seen by how he tried to even assassinate his old friend Hiruzen, whereas Hiruzen held a great deal of affection for him. That's good to hear. And yes, we finally found out who those mercenaries were. Hiruzen took a smoke from his pipe and casually spoke, they were some rebels from the Land of Iron it seems. We mainly found some clues from their unique body tattoos, they are from the Land of Iron. Then, the Land of Iron ambassador cleared it all. I'm sorry. But this is all I can tell you. They requested for the rest to be confidential. Due to their diplomatic ties and an official request from the Land of Iron, Hanova also agreed not to use the information extracted from their souls, or publicize their identities. It seems they were important clan members from that country. It was some infighting. Niji and Guy nodded. Niji also already somewhat guessed the story. For that strong of Guy to not be present in the story in the original world. Maybe Mifune dealt with him personally and sealed it. As for why the original team Guy didn't participate in that fight, in the original. It was probably because of the butterfly effect brought by the current Niji. After all, in that world, Niji was much weaker than he was now. So, Mike Guy probably had less confidence to fight there without his students being hurt as well. Therefore, he probably tactically left those guys to go without a fight. Well, let's forget about that. In fact, I came to inform you too that your mission status has been increased from the B level to this level. So, you could go and pick the appropriate paycheck later. So, there are no other rewards like gifting me with some sealed S-class jutsu. It seems that this world is really different from those fanfictions of my previous life or I'm simply not valuable enough for him. After all, what value could I bring to Hiruzen and his faction, when those main branch members control my life and death with basically a single thought? Niji quickly analyzed. Then I'll just have to steal that thing myself in the future, no problem. Niji thought all of a sudden. And congratulations Niji, combing your gentle fist style alongside the eight inner gates. It simply wasn't heard of before. You must have really exceptional chakra control to accomplish that. Hiruzen suddenly started praising Niji. It seems, he also wasn't called a ninja professor for nothing. Kanoha is really a factory for building talents today in the world. Predecessors, you were truly right. Hiruzen suddenly thought emotionally, and then there are Sasuke, Naruto, and others what Niji thought about just now, about stealing Jutsu from his office, never crossed Hiruzen's mind. He started thinking about Sakumo, Minato, Orochimaru, Jiraiya, Tsunade, and other geniuses Kanoha all created in the past. Kanoha was weaker in recent years. But that would soon change. And just as Niji and Mike Guy talked with the Hokage inside the Kanoha building, in another part of the village, another kind of Hokage, but from the shadows, finally got the rest of the report he wanted from his subordinates. His name was Danzo Shimura, and he was the leader of the route. Root carried out missions that Danzo believed would benefit Kanoha, or in many cases, directly himself, because Danzo firmly believed that the stronger and more powerful he was himself the better it would be for the entire Konohagaka in the end. It wasn't always like that. At the beginning, he was just a slightly more cowardly man who wanted the best for Kanoha. However, the decades in power led him to truly get consumed by darkness, becoming more selfish, and equating his own personal power with Kanoha's best interest. In the end, he also had a megalomanic dream of unifying the whole ninja world under Kanoha's, his own, rule. So there would be no more threats to Kanoha present, and no more ninja wars in the world after that. Because of its core views as the unseen ones who support the great tree of Kanoha from the depths of the earth, some of these missions for Kanoha were also less than respectable, such as eliminating individuals that were considered potential threats, simply for expressing their detestation for Kanoha, despite not actually having done anything against the village. The organization's top priority was its secrecy, and most of its missions were carried out in the dark autonomous of Kanoha's authority. Root was officially disbanded after the Achiha clan downfall, due to Danzo spearheading the tragedy, but remained active as an underground organization without care. This shows exactly how lenient and helpless Hiruzen was against his old friend Danzo. The Root was an extremely strict and secretive group, and as such, each member of the organization had a curse seal imprinted on the back of their tongues by Danzo, which, when activated, would paralyze their entire body. If they tried to speak anything about Danzo or the organization, rendering them unable to speak or move. Danzo had also trained its members to lose their emotions, by growing up as brothers from a young age, only to later be made to kill each other. This was done to kill any sense of sentiment or emotional attachment. Danzo himself appeared as a frail, old man, 
who would normally walk with a cane. He had black, shaggy hair, and his right eye was bandaged, secretly concealing a Sharingan underneath. Danzo has had an X-shaped scar on his chin ever since his youth. He wore a white shirt, with a black or dark grey robe over the top of it covering from his feet to just over his right shoulder. The robe concealed his strange right arm which was bandaged and covered with three large golden braces. Niji Hayuga is much stronger than I previously thought. He is currently the Hayuga clan's strongest weapon in a way. But he himself is no threat to me, as he is just a poor bird trapped in a cage. Hiyashi and the Hayuga clan controlling him are the much more important threats to me. I will finally deal with them, once and for all, as soon as this with Orochimaru is all over, and I take over as the next Hokage comma. Danzo played with his cane and thought seriously and a little expectantly. As soon as Team Guy returned from their mission outside, Danzo's subordinates immediately found something weird and started investigating it. Now finally giving Danzo the full report of the mission, still, if that is all true, then he is a big genius just below the level of Shisui and Atachi bastards. Pity, he is useless unless I would have taken him under my wing. His sensei is also quite dangerous. I didn't expect him to be a full late cage level already. It's good he's not suitable to be the Hokage. But either way, I don't mind creating another white fang out of him next comma. Danzo thought about many things, and the potential rivals for the Hokage position after Orochimaru kills Hiruzen during the Chunin exams next. It's good that none of them are interested, not even Jiraiya nor Tsunade. Obviously, Danzo already made an agreement to not let his root intervene in Orochimaru's plan. The Chunin exams are an opportunity for Genin to be promoted to Chunin. The exam structure and evaluation processes differ from one exam to the next, so Genin cannot come prepared. Villagers originally held their own individual exams. However, following the Third Shinobi World War, exams open to all villagers started being held biannually with villagers taking turns hosting responsibilities. These shared exams improve relations between the villagers, help keep each other in balance and up to date with the competition, present up and coming ninja to clients, and create an opportunity for gambling. Although the exams, specifically the final round matches, are designed for there to be an ultimate winner, success does not guarantee promotion, nor does failure preclude it. If the observing ninja and daimyo feel a genin displays the necessary qualities for a chunin, that genin will be promoted, regardless of how they place in the exams. For this reason, it is possible for as many as all of the finalists to pass, or even for none of them. Being victorious simply expands the participants' chances of demonstrating their qualities in the next match. Having too many participants to advance to the following stages seems to be an undesired result as the examiners tend to run additional preliminaries to reduce the number of finalists. Today was the day of the official start of the Kanoha's held second yearly tune-in exams. Genin must enter as a part of a three-man team. It was exam mostly for Kanoha, its allies, and neighboring smaller villages. The morning sun just shone, and the whole village was already buzzing with people. Although there are variations from village to village, the general organizational structure and hierarchy of the ninja systems of each village are about the same. At the top of the organization is the village head, or the cage in the case of the five great shinobi countries. They rule the village and its shinobi together with a council, usually consisting of highly ranked shinobi and elders. The actual shinobi forces are divided into three groups. The regular forces, the Ambu and the medical teams. The regular forces form the foundation of the village and its shinobi system. The majority of shinobi are a part of these forces, and together, either individually or in teams, they perform the majority of the missions the village receives. They are also tasked with various duties within the organization, such as training and administrative duties. When an academy student graduates, they usually become a part of these forces, assuming the rank of Genin. Via various exams and tests, they can be promoted to higher ranks. First to Chunin and Junin after that. Sometimes, when a shinobi is specialized in a very specific skill, they can assume the rank of a special Jonin, which is a rank between Chunin and Jonin. Niji, Tenten, and Rock Lee already met on one of the Kanoha's many high-rise rooftop roads. They were currently walking towards the Ninja Academy where the first phase is being held. Surprisingly, during the last month, after Niji left the medical hospital, they started seeing each other less and less often. Tenten and Niji trained on their own, while Guy trained with Lee. Having already completed the number of missions required for the application to the Chunin exams, Guy left that period of time for them to just focus on training. And as Niji and Tenten requested that they want to train alone, he left them to do just that. Niji trained in his usual routine, at home, and sometimes sparred with Hiyashi, while the Hayuga elders spectated them. He felt like they treated him now like a really strongest guardian dog. Niji really did get a lot of combat experience, and gentle fist style related knowledge from Hiyashi. But he would never be grateful to him or spare him if he ever got a chance to end him. He knew that deep inside, Hiyashi also looked at him as a servant rather than a real nephew. As for other mysteries related to their clan, and the main branch, sadly he hadn't found any related clues. 
He felt increasing urges to break free from their control lately, and he felt like he would soon even possibly come to a breaking point of anger. After all, the stronger one was, the stronger he hated being chained. That's why recently, he also distanced himself a little from his team to meditate and clear his mind. After all, he would never allow himself to make any kind of mistake or a misstep. Until he breaks completely free, he must remain calm and carefully plan his hundred moves ahead like in chess. Niji, I heard that nine rookies of the previous year will also participate in this round. Have you met them before? I feel like they are really out of their place this time around. Tenton slowly walked beside Niji and asked in a smiling tone, seemingly more confident and playful than before. Niji also noticed a while ago that something was different about her. She was definitely getting more and more confident in herself than a month ago. Something good should have happened to her. Well, the two I met before, Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Chiha, are the most special out of them, others not so much. Niji glanced at a head short attendant near him, and casually answered her. After all, how could the reincarnations of the legendary Indra and Ashura Utsutsuki not be special? Niji thought all of a sudden, also getting curious, for a while, if he could change his fate of getting defeated by Naruto this time around, fate. It is bullshit. I will change my fate this time. I guess it's true about Sasuke Chiha. But why that dumb and weak Naruto Yuzumaki? Tenten was surprised by his answer, you'll see everything soon. To which, Niji just replied mysteriously. Anyway, Tenten, I'm also a little curious about you. Exactly what jutsu did you come up with? To Tenten's surprise, Niji suddenly changed the topic. Rock Lee on the side also looked curious. How did you find out? But, he, you'll see it later. It is definitely something unseen before. Tenton smiled a little proudly as she answered. This month was the most extraordinary one in her whole life. She really did invent a completely new jutsu, thanks to her fuinjutsu knowledge and some creativity. After previously seeing that outstanding display of strength on their last mission and feeling her own uselessness, she was sleepless many nights until something finally clicked for her. She got a really big piece of inspiration and started working towards developing a new personal jutsu of her own. She felt like some initial stages of that jutsu could even be implemented in a battle right now. I just don't want to lag behind Niji too much. But this was maybe her biggest reason for it all. Niji felt a little surprised after seeing her admitting it and being so confident. He definitely didn't expect her to break off her limits from the original series. So soon, or at all. In fact, he held much more hopefully. One the side, who now clenched his fists, clearly not mastering anything new. However, Niji felt that Lee calmed down after a while reciting something inside. He also changed a little, but more on the mental side. Niji was right, during their last month of training together. Guy explained to Lee his whole history with Kakashi, and that real man never quit even if they had to wait for decades. That is their way. After a while, they arrived in front of the Konoha Academy they all once attended two years ago. Tenten and Lee looked at it while remembering many memories. Tenten also secretly peeked a little at Niji who remained indifferent and said, let's go in. The large crowd outside slowly made way, passing behind more Gen and Ninja, who stared at them curiously, also a bit respectfully towards Niji, they finally came outside that memorable room number, on the second floor from the original series. There was a large commotion and a circle of people forming around it in apprehension. And just when Tenten and Lee turned towards Niji, they suddenly heard his low but strong voice move. The whole hallway suddenly got silent, people recognizing Niji and curiously giving him a way toward the door in question. They also started gloatingly looking at the two people who stopped them all just now from proceeding. Those two people also surprisingly started sweating a little. At the beginning of the hallway, Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura also came at the same time. That guy Niji, Tenten, and Lee slowly stood in front of the two people in question. One of them had brown hair and dark eyes. His hair was combed down and covered his right eye. The second one had long, spiky, black hair and dark eyes. He had a strip of bandage running across the bridge of his nose, under light-colored marking on his chin. Niji suddenly activated his biakugan. His pupils became sharper, and veins were all over his eyes. Could you release this small illusion? I don't want to embarrass the Chunins of the fellow village. Also, what is your point pretending to be Genin like this? Niji sighed and calmly spoke. The whole room, including the upcoming Team 7, suddenly looked at him in surprise, especially Sasuke. I didn't realize those two were Chunin, while he immediately did. Sasuke also forrowed his brows. Yes, yes. Both of them suddenly released their illusion, revealing a new path toward the next floor. They were just a little stronger than average Chunin. So how could they be opponents of the guy who previously killed two elite Jonins just a while ago? They planned to leave as soon as Niji came from the beginning, huh? Tenten even humped a little as their team went forward in awe of the other Genins there. Let's go, Naruto, Sakura. Sasuke angrily exclaimed and also went ahead. This time around, there was no battle between Sasuke and Rock Lee, as Lee was way more mature. And soon, they 
all came towards the room where all the other applicants this time around gathered. As soon as Niji opened the door, he felt a dozen strong gazes coming toward them. The spacious room was filled with genin from all the villages that came in to participate in this round of exams. However, Niji and his team ignored all of them and slowly walked forward toward the tables. No way a ninja of that level could pressure any of them. Sasuke, Naruto, and Sakura who came after them appeared more shaken. But that slowly changed as one blonde young girl suddenly jumped onto Sasuke and eased the atmosphere a little bit. Shikamaru and Choji also came behind her. Niji instructed his team, and they quickly got further away than them all. Niji always hated loud people like them, and Lee and Tenten respected his preferences. Shikamaru suddenly turned his attention to Niji's back solemnly. Is that the guy Asuma sensei want us to stay away from? Shikamaru had narrow brown eyes, and a typical expression. That suggested he is either bored or irritated all the time around. He has shoulder-length black hair tied in a spiky ponytail. He wore a short-sleeved grey jacket with green-edged sleeves, and the rudimentary Nara clan symbol on the back, under which is a green-lined mesh armor t-shirt. He also wore brown pants, a pair of his clan's traditional silver hoop earrings, and his blue forehead protector around his left arm. Eno, who was standing beside him and pestering Sasuke, also thought weirdly, all of a sudden, after catching a glimpse of Niji, he's more handsome than Sasuke, but also way more gloomy and dark. Not my type, so Sasuke is better. Humph. After a few moments, the final team of Kanoa rookies came to their place, near the entrance door. This time it was Hanata, Kiba, and Shino. All of them suddenly started talking about something loudly, bringing all the attention onto themselves right from the get-go, which wasn't a good thing. Only Hanata flinched after seeing Niji's back a little, but calmed down after seeing Naruto as well. And soon, someone came to remind them. It was a peculiar person with glasses, Kabuto Yakushi. He had onyx eyes and ash gray hair, which he kept in a ponytail. High wore black rim circular glasses. And once they were talking with Kabuto about the Chunin exams, Niji and his team came to a table. But once they got there, they suddenly felt a really chilling and dangerous gaze from one direction. It was coming from the direction of three Sanagaka Genins, Gara, Kankuro, and Tamari. Gara had fair skin, green eyes, and short auburn spiky hair. He lacked distinctive pupils or eyebrows, and he also had a red tattoo with the word love on his forehead. He wore a black bodysuit with an open neck, t-shirt-like sleeves, and almost full-length leggings. With this, he wore a white cloth over his right shoulder and the left side of his hips. He had a wide leather band from his left shoulder to his right hip for carrying his sand gourd, and around which he wrapped his forehead protector. He suddenly gazed towards Niji specifically while thinking to himself, It's great, mother, it's really great. I can feel it in my blood. This guy is really strong, even stronger than that Uchiha. Tamari had teal eyes and sandy blonde hair, which gathered into four consecutive pigtails. Her outfit consisted of a single light purple colored, off-the-shoulders garment that extended two halfway down her thighs, with a scarlet sash tied around her waist. In addition to incorporating a fishnet worn over her shoulders and legs, specifically on her right calf and her left thigh, she also wore her black forehead protector around her neck. Gara, calm down. I plead you, think of a plan. Seeing how Gara started madly shaking and grinning as soon as he saw the white-clothed teenager on the other side of the room, she started whispering to him, while also peeking a little curiously at Niji. Just who is that guy? Gara didn't produce this kind of reaction in a long time. This Kanoa is really a giant factory for geniuses. Or better said, a perfect place for Gara. I just hope that idiot doesn't mess up our plans, comma. Kankoro, with one eye closed, also observed Niji. He wore a Benraku puppeteer's costume, a black, baggy, full body suit with a red and yellow circle on the front. He also wore a black hood that covered his head completely, and had cat-like ears and a forehead protector on his forehead. He also had a different puppet makeup applied to his face. Niji turned his gaze away from Gara, not caring about him anymore while thinking to himself. I must avoid that idiot, at all costs, inside the forest of death next. All my plans will be ruined, comma. During this stage, Gara was quite an interesting person. However, later after Naruto used his famous talk no jutsu on him, he faded into the second row in part 2 of the original series. Then he looked at the next performance in which, all of a sudden, one weird looking sound ninja attacked Kabuto, near the entrance door. But, that also got over, once the Ibiki Marino, the protector of the first test, finally came in a large puff of smoke. And with that, the first test started. Ibiki Marino was Kanoha's special jonin, and the commanding officer of the Kanoha Torture and Interrogation Force. Ibiki has a large, imposing figure, which he complements with a rugged head and face covered with old wounds and scars. And soon Ibiki started explaining the test, and then it started. The first stage is, at a glance, an hour-long written test of 10 questions. However, the first 9 questions are too difficult for an average genin to be able to answer. 
The real objective, therefore, is to cheat. Either copy from one of the few genin that can answer the questions, or from one of the chnin embedded with the examinees. If a genin is caught cheating five times, they and the rest of their team are disqualified. The goal is also to force the genin to apply critical thinking. In most cases, being caught cheating means instant failure. But the two-point reduction is meant to give them a chance, instead of trying again without being caught, and make them realize they have to cheat. Getting the correct answer to these nine questions is not ultimately important, as it is possible to pass without answering any of them at all. 45 minutes into the first stage, Jen and are given the opportunity to answer the tenth question. They are first warned that, if they answer the question incorrectly, they will not be allowed to take the exams ever again. If they forfeit which also disqualifies the rest of their team before hearing the question, they will be allowed to retake the exams another time. This option is, itself, the tenth question. If a genin is willing to face the unknown of the tenth question, they are ready to be a tune-in. Ibiki tried everything imaginable to get as many genin to drop out as much as possible. But in the end, Naruto Uzumaki's open determination to face this unknown inspires all of the remaining genin, causing 26 teams a higher number than average to pass to the second stage in the end. Of course, Niji already remembered all of this from his previous life once he combined his past memory of the series with Ibiki's behavior here. So, same as in the original, his team also passed. The forest of death where the second test was being held was surrounded by a metallic fence. Its perimeter with 44 gates equally spaced around it. This perimeter is where Shinobi entered. Inside was a river, a forest, and a tower located in the exact center. The forest's radius was about 10 kilometers. It lay to the north of the 43rd training ground. Within the forest were several large and deadly creatures, such as leeches, tigers, snakes, and bears, as well as deadly poisonous plants and insects. Currently, all the genins who passed the first part of the exam stood in front of that creepy place. It was very hot outside, and the forest in front oozed with many dangerous feelings. Niji also watched the short episode between Anko, the proctor of this second exam, Naruto, and Orochimaru, who disguised himself as a female ninja of the Kusagika, just then. Niji tried to not stand out at this time, as this was still not the time for him to meet the Orochimaru yet. They all also needed to sign their consent forms a short after. And then Anko officially started explaining this exam in detail. Three man teams are given either a heaven scroll or an earth scroll before entering the forest. They then have five days for the entire team to reach the building in the center of the forest, with one of each scroll in their possession. How they acquire the other scroll is up to them, by force or by trade being the most common options. Because of the natural hazards of the forest, the absence of services or outside assistance, and the likely conflict with other teams, Jenin must sign liability waivers, before entering to release Kanoha from responsibility for any potential injuries or deaths. If a team loses their starting scroll they are not automatically disqualified, as they may use the remaining time to acquire another copy of the scroll they've lost. By the same extension, acquiring both scrolls does not guarantee completion of the second stage, as they still must reach the center building in time. As the second stage goes on, teams that have lost their scroll will tend to gather around the building, hoping to prey on those with both. Alternately, teams that already have both scrolls can linger outside the building, taking scrolls from others to reduce the competition in later stages. Genin are forbidden from opening either scroll until they have reached the central building. If they follow this instruction, the scroll will summon a higher ranked ninja to grant them advancement to the next stage. If they do not follow this instruction, the ninja will render them and everyone else in the area unconscious for the duration of the second stage. It was a test of their order following ability. It was ultimately time for the exam to start after all those explanations, consent form gatherings, and scroll allocations. Niji, Rockley, and Tenton stood in front of the 41st gate of the forest. And like that, on the appropriate signal, all the Genin teams entered this forest at the same time. Niji, Rockley, and Tenten swiftly rushed out at the same time, jumping all over trees toward their destination. Niji immediately reminded and warned them seriously, remember, you just need to listen to me and my Bayakigan this time. Niji's goal this time was just to try and not mess up with the following plot, in other words, to not arouse the interest of Orochimaru prematurely, as he was still in his peak strength. There would be a better time to get what he wants from him later, while he was weakened, and he also wanted to avoid that Mad Mangara, so as to not mess up the next plot. What are we going to do first, Niji? Lee and Tenten nodded, and Lee asked while they ran ahead. We're going to hide until the fifth day and then come to the central tower and pass. I can certainly notice anyone, and then we'll evade them in an advance. But first, let's find a couple of cannon fodders to get the scroll we need. Niji replied seriously, to which Tenten and Lee turned a little surprised but didn't ask too much as Niji was always the leader of their team. And just then, after a couple more minutes, they suddenly heard some kind of painful shrieks coming from somewhere. What's that Niji? 
Tenten asked curiously all of sudden, while Niji immediately activated his Byakugan to check. It seems that the Team Kurenai got the first scroll already, forget about it. Team Kurenai. That's the team with that Hinata Hayuga. Tenten nodded, also having a touch of a bad feeling towards that team, because the princess of the main branch of Niji's clan was there. She already learned about many things and practices of that clan, and her heart was always sad for Niji. Some time passed while Team Guy was hiding, gathering supplies, food, and water, when Niji suddenly realized he came to a problem. Due to his effects on Lee's change of character and their change of route due to the butterfly effect brought by him, it was questionable exactly how and why Lee would rescue Sakura and them from those Atogaka ninja Orochimaru, sent to kill Sasuke. Niji needed Sasuke alive, or else the whole plot setting would suddenly collapse, and Niji would therefore have no further advantage of plot familiarity from his past life after that. Therefore, he decided to personally secure Sasuke's safety and preserve that advantage as much as possible. So, Niji immediately found the location of past out and injured Naruto and Sasuke alongside a sleepy Sakura anxiously guarding them in front of some kind of a tree husk, so he brought Tenten and Lee there with him as well. They stood now on top of a nearby tree and observed down below. Orochimaru already printed his curse mark onto Sasuke and turned Naruto unconscious by tempering with his nine tails seal. Niji didn't get the chance to previously observe that situation, as he didn't want to be noticed by Orochimaru in any way, as his Byakugan range was relatively short. Niji, why do you want to help and guard those rookies suddenly? This isn't like you. Tenten on the side questioned Niji. He proposed to help them after noticing their situation through his Byakugan. Lee agreed to help immediately, but she was a little doubtful as to Niji's real purpose. Well, don't you already know, Tenten? They are the students of Gai Sensei's best friend, Kakashi Hattik. Niji answered in this way, that being the most reasonable explanation he could give now. Well, if it's for Gai Sensei, I guess Niji would help, comma. Tenten slowly accepted his explanation but also remained feeling a little weird. Basically, she knew that Niji wasn't the kind to help anyone. Oh no, Niji, those Otakagaka shinobi you previously saw really came to make trouble here. Lee suddenly exclaimed, feeling more passionate now that he remembered that those were the students of Guy's best friend. There were three of them incoming now, two male teenagers and one female. One of them called Dosu, had bandages covering most of his face, leaving only his left eye and eyebrow uncovered. He also wore a large poncho with long sleeves, a snake pattern scarf around his neck, a straw raincoat protruding from the back of his scarf, and a large amplifier on his right arm for most of his attacks. His back was hunched, which made him look smaller than he really was. Another one of them, called Zaku, had spiky, black hair and dark eyes. He wore a beige shirt with two black stripes and three prints of the kanji for death down the front. His forehead protector had an attached hapuri under the cloth rather than connected to the metal plate. And the female one amongst them, named Kin, had fair skin, black eyes with very long black hair, almost reaching down to her calves, tied by a violet ribbon right near the end. She wore a forehead protector, a pale green vest somewhat similar to a flak jacket, snack pattern pants with a snake pattern skirt over it, and a snake pattern scarf around her neck, much like her teammates. Niji observed their chakra closer than before now, and then lightly concluded, they don't look like much. And, since I propose to help them, I will deal with these guys alone, it will be over quickly. Humph, do what you want. Tenten snorted lightly while glancing at the pressured and distressed, nearly crying, pink-haired Sakura, with a face as white as a sheet, down below, after her traps failed to hurt her opponents. Lee sweat dropped a little bit, while Niji fasipum mentally. Did she misunderstand something? Never mind, women, comma, Niji thought while feeling a bit weird, and then he quickly jumped down below, to deal with the approaching attack of the Atogaka team, now rushing closer to Sakura. Just as Sakura's first tear was about to fall, and those three hostile shinobi crushed her, a sudden wave of chakra-like pressure came in between their positions, separating her from her attackers. Sakura opened her eyes wide in confusion and daze, as she now saw a figure with a tall and wide back, and freely falling black hair, on top of his white kimono shirt, standing in front of her place. W what? N Niji Hayuga. Sakura looked at his back and felt unbelievable inside. She rubbed her eyes for a moment to see if she was perhaps hallucinating all of this. I is he helping me? But why? Who are you? The three Otogaka attackers jumped back and one in the middle, named Dosu, dangerously asked in surprise. He was the calmest and most analytical person out of the whole team. Your name is Sakura, right? Don't misunderstand this. I saw that you and your team were in danger, with my Byakugan, and decided to lend a helping hand. We're from the same village, and our teachers are even great friends. Niji turned around to look at her first and then calmly explained. So, that's how it is. Sakura suddenly felt like a giant rock fell off her chest, knowing Niji's abilities. Yes, I understand, thank you for your help. She joyfully replied as she glanced at her teammates still in a coma with big relief. She felt like they barely dodged this upcoming disaster. The last few hours were the darkest ones in her entire life. 
First, that cruel and heinous snake-like woman, with monstrous strength, attacked her team, doing various weird things to Sasuke's and Naruto's bodies. Then she faced a whole night full of bad nightmares, on the lookout for them. Or if she will maybe return to harm them. And then this happened in the end, she finally felt relieved. Hey, I don't care who your teachers are. He asked who are you, and why do you dare to butt in like that? You canola brats are such a pain. The more hot-blooded Saku suddenly shouted at Niji. Why are you yelling from such a distance? Come closer and check who I am if you want to know. Niji rebutted with a stoic face. Not putting them all in the eye, he wanted to end this quickly. Before possibly Gara or Orochimaru find out about him being here, everything must go with the plot. Damn it, you brat. Zaku suddenly held his hands high in the air. Weird tubes coming from both of his palms. But before he could launch his special attack, he suddenly heard Dosu with a serious face shouting to him sternly. Wait, Zaku, you idiot. This guy isn't normal. Did you see the weirdness of that previous attack of his? He's really strong. We all need to go together against him this time around. Hun. At least one of you isn't stupid then. Yes, he's right, I'm really strong. But he's also wrong, you currently have zero chance against me. Even if you all launch an attack together, it's still useless. Niji replied in a matter-of-fact-like tone. He also noticed just now that more spectators came to watch. Shikamaru, Choji, and Ino also hid in the nearby bushes, preparing to watch the upcoming clash. Zaku, Kin, let's do our strongest combo right from the start. Dosu solemnly exclaimed all of a sudden, without preparing to argue with them, already rushing forward in a sideways manner. He was mainly a close combat fighter. His main attack was done with help from the resonating echo speaker on his right forearm which he used to generate sound for his attacks. That was a porous metal gauntlet that is used to amplify or absorb sound waves caused by his arm's movements. With that gauntlet Dosu can direct the sound waves based on how he moves his arm, or he can guide them at a specific target using his chakra. Because it's sound, it usually can't be blocked. The sound damages his targets is semicircular canals, throwing them off balance so that they can't stand, move, or fight. Additional side effects include bleeding ears, distorted vision, and vomiting. Kin is focused mainly on sneak attacks toward their enemies. She mainly used Semba needles as her fighting style, which she could throw with great accuracy to strike at her opponent's vital points. Zaki was the main intense damage dealer and long-range striker of their team. He had been physically altered with unnatural enhancements that improved his abilities. He was fitted with hollow air tubes that extended through his arms and opened through his hands, allowing him to propel a combination of air pressure and sound in various ratios, controlled by his own chakra. Niji just stood silently as Dosu slowly approached him while holding his weird metallic arm and Kin jumped onto what she considered to be his current blind spot, whereas Zaku launched a big sonic attack wave that crushed half of the nearby trees and dirt, already exposing all of the spectators. Rotation. Niji first launched a large enough rotation to protect himself and nearby Sakura and her team. Sakura, and now exposed team Asuma, looked in shock and amazement as the enormous sonic boom presently collided with his also large blue rotating chakra force, stopping it. Haha. <laughs> Got you now. However, just as the sonic wave of energy was neutralized, somewhere behind him, Niji saw one-eyed Dosu swinging his arm in a mad way while rushing towards him. Niji got dizzy, and knelt, while Dosu grinned more than ever, you're finished now, cocky bastard. And just when excited Dosu wanted to go for the finishing blow, thinking that his attack already messed up Niji's inner ear canals, he got surprised when he looked at Niji's veiny eyes, and then at his white palm suddenly pressing onto his unguarded chest. And then, with a thump, he fell out while feeling dumbfounded. However, it was pretty easy for Niji to focus a chunk of his chakra inside of his ears through nearby Tenketsu points in the head to defend against that kind of attack. However, it was still not over as Kin, from the side, suddenly shoot a barrage of her Senbin needless toward Niji. But Niji swiftly dissipated from his place, already standing beside her, while apparently also holding the passed out Dosu on his shoulder, hitting her in the chest as well. He's that fast. In the next second, Niji appeared in front of Sakura, and now her teammate's bodies in the open. He now held both Dosu's and Kin's bodies, and then mercilessly threw them at the stupefied Zaku. Zaku sweated and held his arms high in the air, in hopes to launch his sound attack again. But Niji already got to him too, hitting him in the chest, also slowing his heart for the next few hours. He then swiftly moved all of their bodies aside, before coming back to his previous position. Now Ino, Shikamaru, and Choji were also there looking at him with stars in their eyes. Tenten and Lee came down as well. Rock Lee praised him a little, while Tenten gazed at stunned Sakura angrily. I slowed down their heart rhythms, 
They won't be able to move for at least a few hours, Niji said. This guy is at least at the elite Jonin level of strength. That secret S-Class mission Asuma Sensei said he completed must have been truly extraordinary. Hyuga clan. I didn't think they were so scary before, comma, Shikamaru already deduced many things while watching this previous battle of Niji's. Sakura managed to calm herself down just now. But just as she wanted to thank him for his help, Ino surprisingly stood in front of Niji confidently with a hot gaze, while making some kind of a pretty pose. Hello, Niji Hayuga, my name is Ino Yamanaka. I don't think we met properly before. Apparently, after watching this battle, all of her previous indifference toward Niji went away. No kidding. If she had a guardian that strong, then would she need to hide away the whole exam like she previously did just now? Shikamaru face palmed at the sight of this, cursing Ino inwardly. However, Ino didn't notice that Tenten who stood on the side and watched her, now basically had fire written all over her eyes. She looked like she was ready to burst and lash out at any moment. However, to Niji's good luck, just at this time, some kind of purple demonic chakra started pouring out of the passed out Sasuke's body. Then the black-haired teenager stood up in a strange manner, while all the genin present on the scene suddenly unknowingly hid behind Niji's back, in shock and fear. With their eyes wide open, and only Sakura anxiously shouted toward him as Sasuke. Hearing her voice, Sasuke finally opened his eyes, with his Sharingan already activated, and mysterious and scary looking patterns now creeping all over his body. What the hell happened here? Sasuke asked coldly while looking at the worried Sakura beside him, Naruto on the ground, and all the other genin present on the scene, unknowingly hidden behind Niji's back, who looked at him with some interest with his Byakugan fully activated. Is this Orochimaru's curse mark? It definitely looks foreign to all the chakra types I saw until now. No, it's absorbing something. It's truly related to natural energy. Niji looked towards Sasuke like he was watching a fascinating animal. One of the things he was probably the most interested in right now was natural energy. So, that's how it is that was the way all along. Niji didn't realize, but his expression got overly excited, and everyone around started looking at him strangely. Even Tenten and Lee rarely saw him being so excited about anything. And gradually he started getting more intense expressions. Orochimaru's Curse Seal is a forbidden technique that is designed to give its bearer more powerful chakra, transform their body, and enslave them to his will. It contains his Senjutsu Chakra, a specially engineered enzyme, extracted from Jugo's blood, and a fragment of Orochimaru's consciousness. The Curse Seal appears as three identical symbols in a circular pattern on the bearer's body in its dormant state, which then spreads across the body when activated. Unlike other Junjutsu, almost every individual with this Curse Seal, will have a symbol unique to them. Orochimaru is the only person capable of branding someone with his cursed seal which he casts, by injecting his chakra into the victim with a bite from his fangs and a unique hand seal, a ritual similar to how the white snake sage of the Ryuchi cave selects his students for teaching Senjutsu. After the branding, the victim falls unconscious as their body is forced to adapt to its tainted power. Only one in ten subjects is able to survive the process. Sasuke currently activated the first state of the Curse Seal. It functions by absorbing the bearer's chakra and their natural energy from their surroundings, converting it into Senjutsu Chakra through the consciousness within the Curse Seal, and then pumping it back into their chakra pathway system to enhance their abilities. The symbol of the Curse Seal replicates itself to cover their body in its markings. How far the pattern spreads is in proportion to how much power the bearer is drawing from the Curse Seal. One can achieve at least twice as much chakra of higher quality making their techniques more powerful, and strengthening their physical capabilities, such as their speed, strength, and reflexes. It is a temporary but significant boost to their power that can allow them to fight harder and longer than they normally could. However, the Curse Seal has its drawbacks, in addition, as it is meant to invade the mind and body of the bearer. After it has first manifested, its presence leaves the bearer in constant pain for a time and it reacts whenever the bearer tries to release chakra to force its activation, by drawing out more of their chakra regardless of their will. It requires an adjustment period for someone to consciously control the curse seal's activation without it acting against their will, something with depends on the bearer's own strength of will. Every time its power is released, the malignant spiritual energy hidden inside slowly erodes their will, and stimulates their darker emotions to make them susceptible to Orochimaru's control. An example of this control is that when he is nearby, he can make them suffer crippling pain through their curse seal, which leaves them helpless in his presence. Why are you looking at me like that, Hayuga? Sasuke suddenly furrowed his brows and slowly started walking toward Niji, while ignoring Sakura's pleas to calm down. He really was not in a normal state right now. Moreover, Niji really did look at him like he was some kind of idiot, or better said an interesting experiment. Seeing that something was not right, everyone moved further away than Niji. Niji looked at Sasuke, with his Byakugan, without missing a second, analyzing everything. Combining his current vision of Sasuke's inner chakra pathway system and his canon knowledge, Niji was getting more and more sure of something. Even Tenten and Lee looked at Niji worriedly, 
but he cut them off once he regained his composure a little. Tenten, Lee, take everyone away from here, even Sakura and Naruto, once you get a chance. I'll have to fight with him now. Sasuke is not in a normal state right now. Or it could be said that he is currently possessed by something. Only I can solve this problem for him out of you all. Tenten suddenly, to the surprise of Rock Lee and others, clenched her fists a little and said seriously first. I understand, Lee and I will take Sakura with us as soon as we get the chance. Everyone, you sense the level of Chakra and Sasuke currently? It's dangerous to be here. Let's move a little further. Tenten wasn't stupid, judging by Niji's sudden, once-in-lifetime expression. She realized that there was something really important related to the current Sasuke could cheer her that Niji wanted to explore, this may even be related to his biggest wish in life. That wish that can't even be talked about Tenten's face was solemn. She now remembered exactly how happy Niji was when he learned a fuinjutsu technique from her, sufficient enough to seal his eyes away. When he thought that she wouldn't know, she realized it all silently. Maybe this time is something related to that as well. Niji got surprised at Tenten's resoluteness, and wrote it down in his heart a bit, while explaining to the restless Sakura, Sakura, look after Naruto and keep yourself away. I need to help Sasuke next. Damn, damn, as this day didn't have to get any more troublesome comma. Shikamaru groaned as he walked back with Ino and Choji, while watching Niji's and Sasuke's weird stand off in front. Why did their faces get so mad? And what's with Sasuke's weird body and chakra? Ino thought. You bastard. Hayiga, why would I need your help? Fine, if you want it. I wanted to beat you a long time ago already ever since that time in the hospital. Sasuke's face suddenly got more violent. Sasuke, you should feel it already. This power isn't yours, and it's actually harming you. Let me help you. Niji smirked and slowly started walking closer to Sasuke. What the heck do you know? I'm an Avenger, any kind of power is welcome by me. Moreover, I feel like with this I can easily beat that proud face of yours. Sasuke shouted remembering his dream and everything that happened inside of it, when his clan was killed by Itachi once again. Then there is no other way. I'll help you myself. Niji and Sasuke suddenly disappeared from their places and clashed somewhere in the air. Everyone around the area looked in awe at such a speed. Seeing it this close, it certainly appears possible to do. He, Sasuke, you've given me the best present in this life so far. Niji and Sasuke quickly traded a couple of blows. Sasuke was seriously using his kunai to hurt Niji, while Niji looked like he was constantly checking something more. However, after a few more minutes, Sasuke started cutting Niji around, here and there, a little bit, my body is no match for his current enhanced one. It's time I turn serious. Small, blue chakra-like projectiles from a couple of Niji's individual Tenketsu points suddenly started protruding toward all of Sasuke's weak points, which Niji determined to be weak, judging from the movements of Sasuke's muscle contractions. However, surprisingly, Sasuke dodged the most vital ones with his Sharingan and then jumped back, now also a little bit grazed by the impact of those non-lethal projectiles of Niji that managed to land on a few areas of his body. Is that Sharingan's eye of insight and allowing him to quickly figure out the patterns of my attacks and dodge on time? To think it was this good in a state with just two Tomo on comma, Niji suddenly marveled at his Sharingan. Not just that, his Sharingan is probably also quite capable at kinetic vision. Kinetic vision is the unique ability of the Sharingan, allowing its user to see things relatively fast thing in slow motion, making them appear slower inside the brain processing center than they truly were in reality. It was one of the abilities that Byakugan didn't have, but Sharingan did, alongside Jinjutsu ability to evolve through mental disturbances, and already mentioned pattern recognition and copying skills. He is much stronger than I expected, this is already a low Jonin level strength. Then he was also on the elite level of strength by the time the first part of the Naruto series ended. Truly Indra for you second gate, should be enough to end this in combination with my gentle fist sneak attack. And if I keep it open for less than 5 minutes, there won't be any problems with the exhaustion like the last time, comma. Niji jokingly looked at the overly confident Sasuke in front of him as he made a plan. Hi Iga, it seems that I somewhat overestimated you, to be honest. Then let me show you just who is the real genius. Sasuke suddenly moved his hands up quickly and launched an ninjutsu attack as a diversion for his following main finishing physical attack, fire style. Phoenix Flower Jutsu. The user of this technique spits a volley of small fireballs into the air. At a glance, it can appear as though there was only one fireball that then burst into many. The many small flames move wildly through the area, potentially mesmerizing targets as they're surrounded. The user controls each individual flame with their chakra allowing them to guide each at the target and, consequently, making this technique difficult to evade. Shuriken can be hidden within the flames, as Sasuke currently did, not only making them more deadly upon impact, but also, 
by controlling the flame's movements, giving users a means of controlling the shuriken in addition. I just need to sever the connection between the curse mark and the rest of his chakra system. That's where all of that chakra is coming from, comma. All right, Sasuke, second gate. Gate of Healing. This time around, Sasuke was surprised by Niji's burst of speed as he dodged all the upcoming flames, and as he got right in front of him in a second. Therefore, Sasuke could only pull his kunai out again to try and stab Niji immediately up close. However, this time it's different. In this inner gate heightened state, Niji could actually seal some of Sasuke's Tenketsu points on his tights with his arms quickly after he dodged the kunai stab in front. Damn, I can't move. Sasuke yelled and turned around, then waved his sharp kunai toward Niji who attempted to sneak attack him from his back. Sasuke sensed it immediately with his dejutsu. He, Sasuke, let me try this new one on you. In a moment once Niji apparently wanted to land a palm on Sasuke's back, and when Sasuke's kunai was coming straight toward his heart, Niji suddenly did an unbelievable thing. He straight abandoned his attack, jumped horizontally to dodge the kunai, exerted his Byakugan to the maximum, and made a high precision shot toward the chakra line that connected the curse mark to the rest of Sasuke's body. Enhanced Chakra Scalpel This was a technique mainly used by medical shinobi as their main means of attack. However, anyone could learn to make and use it, if they have a high enough level of chakra control, especially Hyuga's. Moreover, this time around, Niji's Chakra Scalpel wasn't just around a palm size, like the one Kabuto or Tsunade used in the original series. It was a whole arm or more in length. And Niji didn't stop once Sasuke got dizzy and gradually started collapsing down. For him, these next few moments were the most important. Before Sasuke completely fell, he quickly caught him after he turned off his second gate. At an unbelievable speed, he brought his right hand and placed it on top of the curse mark. Then he activated his chakra control ability, trying to take away Orochimaru's Senjutsu, still active from it. The only way to gather natural energy in this world, into your body, was to learn the secret method from the Snake Toad, or Slug Sage, the last one being just Niji's own hypothesis. There was one completely different additional method, and that was to be born into Jugo's clan. But that one wasn't a good choice, mainly because you couldn't control when you wanted to absorb natural energy, and when to not. Niji did not want that, and more so, he did not want to be bitten by a white snake sage, nor did he think it was realistic to go the toad or slug route as well. But, after he saw Sasuke's inner chakra pathway system just a while ago, he thought of another brilliant idea. The curse mark worked on the principle that Orochimaru's Senjutsu chakra constantly brought in the natural energy from the atmosphere when it was activated, then mixed it with the host chakra to finally produce some kind of a new chakra with Jugo's enzyme for the host's body. Orochimaru never mastered the sage mode as his body wasn't strong enough for that but he mastered the means of gathering natural energy around him, and then creating Senjutsu Chakra. Natural energy is the energy that is created by the air, water, and earth of the world. It exists anywhere and everywhere, constantly circulating throughout the planet as a part of nature itself. Senjutsu is the process of drawing natural energy inside your body, and then blending it with your own chakra to create Senjutsu Chakra for adding power to your existing techniques, while also allowing for the use of techniques that would not otherwise be possible. The curse mark of Orochimaru being an example for the second. And the sage mode was the state achieved when a practitioner empowers the entirety of themselves with Senjutsu Chakra. It then circulates throughout their entire chakra pathway system to activate the body by significantly enhancing its strength, speed, reflexes, senses, healing, and durability, as well as strengthening every aspect of their ninjutsu, jinjutsu, and tajutsu. Fire is hotter, water is fiercer, lightning is faster, the wind is sharper, and the earth is harder. Illusions are more tenacious in binding the victim's senses, and leaving a deeper effect on their psyche. And physical blows are easily capable of shattering steel or collapsing buildings with their might. Just as chakra makes a ninja superior to ordinary humans, Senjutsu chakra makes a sage superior to an ordinary ninja. A sage's connection to natural energy amplifies their innate sense of chakra to a level beyond the ability of all but the most skilled of senses in both range and accuracy. At close range, it serves as a type of threat perception which aids the sage by helping them predict their opponent's moves to avoid incoming attacks and set up the ideal counterattack. At long range, they can perceive the chakra of anyone within several kilometers at the very least and perhaps surpass even that with training and focus. And as a sage has mastered the ability to absorb natural energy, they can directly manipulate the natural energy around them as well. They can use it as an extension of their own bodies to attack beyond their physical reach, infuse it into their surroundings to control the terrain, or interfere with its flow to bend the atmosphere to their will. And what Niji needed for his new theoretical jutsu, which he always dreamed of and visualized in his head a long time ago, wasn't entering sage mode like Naruto and Jiraiya, for example. It wasn't the ability to produce Senjutsu Chakra like Orochimaru either. 
It was just the ability to gather the natural energy around him when and where he wanted. And he will presently obtain such means. Niji's face sweated hard, his Byakugan urged to the maximum, as he slowly moved that part of the Orochimaru Senjutsu Chakra from Sasuke's curse mark into himself. After a dozen or more seconds, it miraculously worked. Niji successfully moved it from his right hand to the area of his stomach, where the strongest and the most present part of the human chakra pathway system was, so that he would successfully keep that part of Orochimaru's Senjutsu Chakra always tightly and consciously sealed inside, until he wanted to use it and draw natural energy. He would from now on be keeping an eye on it for 24 hours, 7 days a week. But thankfully, he was still a Hyuga and a Hyuga with the strongest chakra control skills in history. Those weird markings already disappeared from Sasuke's body, and Niji relaxedly fell down to the ground. No, I can't relax yet, until I successfully mastered that technique. I must hide from Orochimaru before that. Orochimaru certainly wouldn't take it kindly that he destroyed Sasuke's curse mark. Niji now felt a foreign-like chakra sealed tightly by himself inside his stomach area. It wasn't a part of Orochimaru's soul, but just a part of Orochimaru's Senjutsu Chakra, so he wasn't feeling weird about it. And he would currently do anything to get more strength, he had no time to feel weird. And soon, everyone who watched the fight from the side, suddenly came closer in amazement. Firstly, crying Sakura checked Sasuke's pulse and then she bowed hard in thanks, after noticing everything was right. Thank you, Niji. She started dumbly repeating it many times while crying. Are you alright, Niji? Pretty worried Tenten quickly went to Niji and picked him up on her pale shoulders. However, what happened next stunned her whole being. Niji suddenly smiled for the first time, at her warmly from the heart, and whispered, Thank you for understanding me during all this time. Her whole face suddenly blushed and she couldn't remember anything she could say at that time. Meanwhile, Lee, Ino, Shikamaru, and Choji just looked dumbly at the weird scene, not understanding a thing. Shikamaru asked first, Niji, what happened there with Sasuke? He was possessed by some kind of evil chakra. That's the best way I could describe it. Then I led that chakra out of his body with my Byakugan and chakra control. Niji, still in Tenten's embrace, answered, We should all ask Sakura about that. Was Sasuke in contact with something weird recently? Niji pretended like he didn't know anything, which could help him better explain it to the village higher-ups later if needed. What? You really solved it, Niji? No, I mean, we were attacked by a very powerful enemy who bit Sasuke on his neck, and then Sasuke became sick after that. He also got some kind of a curse mark. Sakura immediately excitedly started explaining that whole encounter to the present teens. Well, Sakura, I don't know if that snake woman, you said, would suddenly find that her seal got destroyed by me. But we must go now. I feel like I also have no chance against such an opponent. You need to be careful from now on. I can't help you any more than this, I'm sorry. Niji patiently explained after she finished speaking. He prepared to run the hell out of there before Orochimaru came after him. Until he fully developed that jutsu he felt like even personally running away from Orochimaru would be hard. Not to mention fighting him. Orochimaru will certainly go and plant Sasuke another curse mark again and he will not go after me immediately. He probably doesn't even know who did it yet. We're going straight to the central tower and then out of this forest. After hearing him, Shikamaru also opened his eyes wide and said, Yes, Ino, Choji, we should also go. There is nothing we could do against an opponent of such a level. Niji, you already got your scrolls right. Then you should report all of this to the higher-ups once you pass the exam. I feel like that person certainly isn't a genin, more like some kind of a malicious intruder, and her goal is Sasuke. Shikamaru quickly spoke while everyone remained quiet and listened to him seriously. Yes, Niji, you should do that. And I don't blame anyone, especially you Niji, who already helped us this much today. Please just report it to the village higher-ups. If you get the chance, we'll hopefully manage to survive until that. Sakura clenched her fists as she spoke, again feeling restless after realizing that monstrous person could make a move on Sasuke and them again. At this time, Naruto woke up, but nobody had time for his stupid antics, and everyone quickly left. In the end, seven teams managed to pass to the final stage of the Chunin exams, which was more than twice as many as had been expected. As this was very unusual, to cut down the prevailing genin from the second exam, a preliminary round was staged before the third and final stage of it. Several days passed already since Niji and his team safely passed through the Forest of Death and arrived at the central tower. Then they opened their scrolls, and a tuning came, introducing them to the next stage of the exam. When the time for it finally came, everyone gathered inside a large hall. It was a hall where the preliminaries, like this one, were usually held inside the Kanoha. The hall was massive with concrete hard floors, a podium above for a small group of people, 
and with a big statue of two hands knotted in some kind of hand seal. It was a perfect place for shinobi fights. Shinobi teachers of every team that passed stood right in front of the big hand seal monument, behind Hokage, and the proctors of all of the previous stages, while genins that passes stood a little further than them. Niji and his team were also there. It's great everything is the same as in the original. Niji thought while looking at all the tuning candidates present here that pass by. Sasuke was also there, and he grimaced hard while clenching his fists and shaking from anger a little after seeing Niji. He half remembered their previous encounter and half didn't. However, he sure knew that he lost against Niji. And, moreover, he did it in that enhanced and powerful state. He was angry mainly at himself, and his weakness especially after that dream made him relive everything with his brother again. Niji Hayuga, I promise, I will defeat you. I swear on my life. And just then he clenched his neck on one side lightly while remembering something else. Right after he woke up again, back there in the forest, that snake person came and attacked them all once again, bitting him in the neck again strangely and planting him with the same black curse mark. And before the attacker left, he mentioned that it wasn't the curse mark's final stage against Hyuga, and that there is more power in it for him to discover. He also mentioned that if he wanted power to defeat that Hyuga boy later and his elder brother next, he should seek him out. Then Sasuke collapsed into a coma once again, and his team barely passed the test, thanks to that Kabuto's help. Niji didn't mind Sasuke's weird movements, of course, he guessed that Orochimaru must have planted him with the curse mark once again. He was looking at the Gara next, who also looked at him madly. Apparently, he conveyed murderous intent with his eyes, probably because previously he didn't find him there in the forest. Kabuto also secretly looked at him once and smiled strangely. Those three Atobika ninjas that he put to sleep now strangely avoided his gaze like a plague. Oddly, just then Niji and Orochimaru's gazes also strangely intertwined. Orochimaru was currently pretending to be the Atogaka's team Jonin Sensei. He wore a black uniform and a forehead protector, standing behind Hokage. His face was also changed to a different one. He looked at Niji with a hint of resentment and curiosity. Right after those three woke up, he learned who probably spoiled his curse mark on Sasuke. Fortunately, it wasn't completely destroyed, so Sasuke's body received it easier than the first time, and it wasn't a 10% chance again to succeed but a much larger one, but still embarrassing his technique in front of his future vessel, whom he wanted to come and seek him out for strength on his own, certainly didn't stand well with Orochimaru. Therefore, this time around, Orochimaru also internally enforced his curse mark with many different protective fuenjutsu seals, so the chakra couldn't be drawn out easily by Niji again, like the last time. Wait, what the hell? But just then, while looking in Niji's direction, Orochimaru's whole being suddenly got surprised. Perplexingly, he could sense a bit of his own Senjutsu chakra from the boy, only he could sense it out of all the people present there, because that's his own Senjutsu chakra. No matter how small it was, at such a close distance, it would be weird if he didn't sense it easily. He kept that part of my Senjutsu chakra he removed from Sasuke inside of his body all this time. But why? What is the point? Orochimaru, with his enormous experience in shinobi matters and techniques, suddenly couldn't find an answer for himself right now. It's simply useless. Why? Orochimaru was an extremely curious person by design, and when he finds something that bothers or intrigues him, he won't stop until he finds an answer even if it took decades. Keeping his Senjutsu Chakra inside of someone could theoretically give them the ability to draw on natural energy, once they desired. But what was the point of that? They would die in the second if they aren't careful. Not like the Hyoga had any connection with Raichi Cave or Mount Mayaboku, nor a strong body required for learning a sage mode or knowledge for casting any Senjutsu enhanced Jutsu like himself. Orochimaru spent many years developing his curse mark Jutsu, which was the only technique he could now enhance with Senjutsu, drawing a very little amount of natural energy from the atmosphere, so it wasn't too dangerous. But still, it was an incredibly hard thing to master. He was also amazed by the way Niji held and blocked that Senjutsu chakra inside of himself at all times. It could be done way more efficiently with Fuenjutsu, but perhaps he doesn't know that yet. However, it's not that he didn't know any better. It's just that Niji couldn't bother to research and create an appropriate Fuenjutsu technique for sealing it, while he had that level of chakra control. It's on such a level that he could even subconsciously keep that Senjutsu chakra always contained. Therefore, the means to accomplish the same goal without wasting any of his precious time next. Either way, this boy is either an incredible genius, or he is incredibly stupid. I will find my answer later. Orochimaru licked his lips a bit and moved his curious gaze away from Niji, pretending not to know him next as Hiruzen coughed and started explaining something to the tuning candidates. He was speaking mainly about the true purpose of the tuning exams. It was the basic knowledge Niji already knew, 
so he wasn't paying too much attention, that they were the microorganism of the real battles between nations, that everyone wanted to win there for their villages, and similar stuff. Hey 8 Jacko, a special Jonin, was tasked with judging this exam, and he explained that because many feudal lords and important people will be watching the main thing later, they can't have pointless fights displayed there, so there would first be preliminary fights between the people here. In the end, Kabuto withdrew from the competition, and after an intense argument with Enko, here is an allowed Sasuke to participate, just like in the original, but without the use of the curse mark. Back in the field, Sasuke and Sakura argued about his condition before he calmed her up. After Kabuto withdrew, 20 people were left, so there would be 10 individual battles. The winner goes to the real third round. Fights are conducted until one of the opponents admits defeat, collapses, or is dead. However, Hei still held the ultimate power to end it if he determines it. Suddenly, they opened a large screen above, and it seemed that the matches would be randomly drawn out. The first match was surprisingly Sasuke against Yoroi, one of Orochimaru's minions. Everyone moved to the upper area to watch including the Genins and their teacher as well. Once Niji's team got there together with Mike Guy, Tenten suddenly asked Niji, Niji, didn't you fix his problem? Why is Sasuke acting so strange all of a sudden? After all, everyone noticed Sasuke's odd behavior in the crowd. Mike Guy also looked at Niji curiously at this time. Kanoha's Jonin's around, and Hokage already knew that Niji somehow managed to spoil Orochimaru's first seal. But, then he attacked and branded Sasuke once again, before swiftly fleeing because the area was filled with Anbu at that time as a result of Anko already informing them of his presence by then. I guess he was branded once again after we left, as I predicted. But, I don't think he will lose here. Niji replied to Tenten, it's good that they didn't ask me to extract the chakra from his once again. Not like Sasuke would agree. I think, with this mindset, he would rather die than ask for my help. And, they didn't ask Niji for help, because this time around, a great Fuenjutsu master was required. Before the fight started, Kakashi warned Sasuke that, if his cursed seal got out of control, he would have to intervene and stop the match to try and control the seal. This barred Sasuke from using any real technique as the seal responded to flows of chakra. Orochimaru looked at them with interest. The match started with Yoroi stealing Sasuke's chakra with his chakra absorption and beating him hard. The match seemed hopeless for Sasuke until he heard Naruto's taunts. He then used the Lion Combo, a partial copy of Kanoha's front lotus, which had been captured by Sasuke's Sharingan. Previously, Kakashi showcased it to him. Unlikely in the original, Yoroi was knocked unconscious, and Sasuke advanced to the next round. After the fight, Kakashi took Sasuke away to try and seal his curse mark. Up next was Zaku and Shino of the team Kurenai. Zaku apparently only had one functional arm, but he bet that he could win regardless. Elsewhere, the curse seal was sealed by Kakashi. But then Orochimaru showed up for Sasuke, asserting that all the genin he currently had at his command were disposable. As Kakashi readied his lightning cutter, Shino commanded a multitude of insects to attack Zaku from behind, leaving the one-armed Zaku unable to defend himself with his unidirectional technique. Zaku then revealed he could use both arms, but it was too late. The insects had blocked the tubes in Zaku's arms, building up the chakra he was trying to use, and making the arms explode, thus ending the fight. Orochimaru left, saying that Sasuke would be his someday. The next was a match between Misumi Tsurugi of the Konohagaka against Kankuro of the Sunagaka. Misumi quickly used his soft physique modification to restrain Kankuro, and threatened to snap his neck until it was revealed that Kankuro Misumi was fighting was just a puppet. The real Kankuro was disguised, controlling the puppet with the puppet technique. He used the puppet, Karasu, to crush Misumi's bones, defeating him and proceeding to the real third stage of the exam. The fourth match was Sakura vs Ino. It was a boring fight. The match dragged on for a very long time, since they seemed to be quite on par, until Ino tried to possess Sakura's body to force her to forfeit the match. However, Sakura's will expelled Ino from her mind. Exhausted and out of chakra, they both went for a final attack, hitting each other at the exact same time and rendering each other unconscious. Hei 8 declared that neither of them would move on to the next round. The big screen above the avenue finally started working its thing again, and the next matchup was about to be announced. It finally stopped and showed Tenten vs Tamari for the next fight. Yes, Tenten was really excited about finally getting to fight. It seems it's time that I try out that jutsu in a real battle. Rock Lee and Mike Guy started also cheering for Tenten and pumping her up, while Niji looked at her curiously. He remembered that she mentioned creating a jutsu before. Thanks, Guy Sensei Lee. Niji looked carefully. I think I will surprise you. All of a sudden Tenten confidently winked toward Niji, but then blushed prettily and quickly jumped down to the ground. This girl well? Let's see what have you got Tenten. I hope you will change your original fate of losing here. I'm rooting for you. Rock Lee and Mike Guy looked in shock as they saw Niji smirking. On the other side, Tamari already dropped to the fighting ground. This is the team made of that guy. 
Gara is the most excited about fighting. We'll see then, I'll have to get serious right from the start. Soon, they came in front of each other, exchanged a couple of tough words, and Heiei announced the match. At first, Tenten started by attacking with ordinary weapons, like in the original, but quickly she noticed that Tamari was very strong, as she easily deflated all of them, before sending a large wind wave toward her. Tenten immediately jumped back all the way to that giant monument. Everyone in the crowd watched curiously to see what would happen next. Until now Tamari clearly had an advantage, in this phase of testing out, as she didn't even fully open her large fan until now. Rock Lee and Mike Guy yelled in support, while Niji curiously watched guessing what her new move was. And just then everyone heard Tenten say, I prepare to leave this for later. But it doesn't matter now, you're very strong. I'm sorry if this is overkill. Hope you'll be alright soon as Kunoichi. Pressure wave. It was a fuinjutsu technique that seals a predefined large amount of chakra in a really small separate pocket space, inside her scroll, under tremendous pressure. Far more than is normally possible. And the user then opens the seal on one side, focusing it in the direction of the opponent. The result is a huge energy chakra blast shot at the opponent. It can be used in a way of a large cannon attack all with many different small pocket dimensions on a large scroll, like a barrage of smaller attacks, but that required more time to prepare and now wasn't possible. So, Tenten started sweating as she quickly poured as much of her chakra inside one seal as possible. Damn, what is she preparing now? Tamari saw Tenten sweating and panting, and quickly fully opened her giant iron fan to the maximum of three stars, and also prepared her strongest move. Great sickle weasel technique. Using her giant folding fan, Tamari causes many currents of wind to collide with each other, creating vacuum pockets. As the wind moves outward from her, it cuts up whatever it comes into contact with, and deflects any attacks coming toward her, even sound-based Jinjutsu. Because of how far the winds travel, this technique is especially useful against opponents that attack from long ranges. This was currently the strongest technique in Tamari's arsenal of Jutsu. However, what came toward Tamari now wasn't an ordinary long-range attack, but a powerful and large beam of energy derived from Chakra. And, as such, Ordinary Wind couldn't do much against it. Everyone inside the hall now had their eyes wide open, as this was the strongest clash they witnessed today, and from the ones, they were least expecting it. That large torrent of sharp wind waves suddenly got broken by a very large and scary looking wave of opposing Chakra energy. Tamari got hit straight to the body, and painfully flew to the nearby wall with a thump, still not fully aware of what happened. Fortunately for her, Tenten still didn't master that attack, as she worked on it for just one month. The energy pressure released was still not perfect as it could be in the future. Tenten jumped down to the floor, and then started falling down to her back, once Hayato declared her to be a final victor. After all, her usage of this technique was also still not the most efficient as it could be in the future. Surprisingly, Niji also noticed her current state in peril, and then he suddenly disappeared from his place, and quickly reappeared on the fighting stage, right behind her, quickly catching her up from behind. She opened her eyes wide in disbelief and blushed on her face, once it happened, but then she fainted due to chakra exhaustion. This girl has some really creative ideas. Good job Tenten. Niji thought while looking at her sleeping face warmly, this move has even more potential to be developed in the future. I will help her. However, the most she lacks is Chakra. He then passingly glanced at the injured Tamari on the other side of the ring, and then again at Tenten in his arms. I guess this is the first time I changed the fate of this world. It doesn't feel bad to be honest. There is no way Tenten would have created that move, had it not been for him to stimulate her. It seemed that she was really way more in love with the current Niji than the one of that other world. She is at least a low-level Jonin now likely, while Tamari is a high-level Chunin. As Niji carried Tenten back to the watching stands, everyone still remained in awe at Tenten's jutsu. Kenkoro who picked Tamari from the ground, had his teeth clenched in anger, Gara on the stands looked at Niji bloodthirstily, and Baki, their sensei, still had his eyes opened in shock. And everyone from the Kanoha's side wasn't any better as well. Even Orochimaru looked a little thoughtful while watching Tenten and Niji, are all of Kinoha Yanjin's this interesting now? When did Tenten learn that move? You all never inform me of anything kids. And, since when were kids you so close? Haha. <laughs> Mike Guy spoke after he checked on Tenten's situation from Niji's arms, and realized that she was right. He could have also picked up Tenten back then as well, but as he looked at Niji behind him, at that time, who also seemed to want to do it, he realized something and stopped his move. Lee was also surprised at both her new move and Niji's reaction just now. Niji himself was also now getting a little surprised because of his previous unnatural reaction. But he felt like he was indebted to Tenten a lot, teaching him Fuinjutsu and keeping his secret safe after realizing it. Also, she never brought him any problems, and for her overall understanding of him. Lee, you will understand one day, 
That is youth. Mike Guy suddenly held Lee by the shoulder and started comically crying. Even Niji found himself ashamed a little bit now as he facepalmed. In the sixth match, Shikamaru went against Kin of the Atogaka. Kin started by dodging the shadow imitation technique and throwing Senban with and without bells, using strings to ring the bells from unexpected positions to divert Shikamaru's attention and attack him from behind. Shikamaru, however, managed to join her shadow with his, using the shadows of the strings she was holding. With Kin matching Shikamaru's movements, each drew a shuriken and flung it at the other. When it came time for them to duck, Shikamaru ducked successfully. But Kin, having previously retreated, banged her head against the wall and knocked herself out which turned out to be the true goal of Shikamaru's battle strategy. Therefore, Shikamaru emerged as the winner of this battle. The next match was between Naruto and Kiba. The fight went poorly for Naruto at first, especially after Kiba's Ninkan, Akimaru, joined the fight and transformed into Kiba with the Beast Human clone technique. Naruto made a comeback by transforming in a layered fashion into Akimaru and then Kiba. So that, when Kiba attacked Naruto, the second transformation, as Kiba, gave way to the first as Akimaru, leading Kiba to attack Akimaru still affected by Beast Human clone. Kiba then focused on attacking intensively to keep Naruto from counter-attacking, until Naruto accidentally broke wind, which stunned Kiba, whose sense of smell was magnified a thousand times at the time. Naruto then beat Kiba by using Shadow clones to perform a new technique, the Yuzumaki combo. And with that battle being over, Niji finally got summoned to battle Hinata for the eighth match. Niji, both Mike Guy and Rock Lee, suddenly turned a bit serious already knowing the full history between Niji and the main branch of the Hyuga clan. Tenten was already sent to rest away. Don't worry, I won't do anything excessive. Niji however just smiled and jumped to the field. Hinata you should withdraw. Eventually, Koronai sighed and whispered to Hinata down below. Hinata herself started shaking from fear as soon as her name was called out against Niji's. She knew better than anyone how strong Niji currently was in using Hyuga's techniques. He was even called the biggest genius in the entire Hyuga clan's history. He was the sole reason her father was so cruel to her, not teaching her anything, not training her, and barely even speaking to her now. He gave all his attention to her sister Hanabi instead. He even always spared with Niji, but not with her. Niji, under the watchful eyes of everyone, slowly came into the center of the field. He stood in front of shaking Hanata and her sensei Kurunai, behind her, who was still bent down, and whispered something to Hanata's ear. If it was someone other than Niji, she wouldn't do that. But knowing full well what Niji was capable of, as well as his situation in the Hayuga family, she didn't want him to utterly crash her now to the point of no return. She still treasured this soft-willed disciple of hers. Hayate suddenly found himself unable to do anything for a while, deciding to give them a few more seconds before announcing the match, having sympathy for the poor girl and her sensei as well. And just then, while Hinata's shaking hand was slowly getting up to surrender, an obnoxious roar from the stands stunned everyone. Hinata, come on, do your best, I believe in you. It was coming from obnoxious blonde-haired Naruto who leaned against the fence and excitedly shouted down, Damn, that idiot. Not now. Koronai bit her lips angrily. Naruto, comma, while Hinata suddenly woke up from her daze, unknowingly moving her hand back, he believes in me. I can't disappoint Naruto, I too can change like Naruto. Even if I lose, I will never give up, comma. After a few more moments of thinking, Hinata's previously scared face suddenly turned resolute. She smiled at Naruto, in the crowd, and then said to Kurunai, Sensei, this is something I must do. I can't always be so scared and weak-willed. I need to do this if I ever want to change. Kurunai looked at her resolute eyes, and slowly shook her head painfully. But then she cast another warning gaze with her pretty face to Niji. She didn't say anything to Hanata, and she went back to the stands, deciding to stop the match herself, if Niji started to get cruel in any way. Orochimaru and Herzun looked down with interest. Lady Hanata, I must say, this truly isn't a logical choice. Niji calmly started speaking suddenly, and then pointed toward Naruto in the crowd next. You're not like that blonde idiot over there. You're not special in any way whatsoever as him. We are all different beings with different circumstances. If he gave you the confidence to enter this fight now, then he truly harmed you in the end. Niji slowly spoke, without revealing a hint of emotions. Damn you, white-eyed bastard. Right after hearing those words, Naruto wanted to jump down and do something. But fortunately for him, Kakashi suddenly held him back in shock. Naruto, don't speak ill of Naruto. He didn't give me confidence. He just reminded me of something. I want to defeat you myself and get back the recognition of my father that I deserve. I don't want to live in your shadow anymore. It seems that insulting Naruto really angered her and gave her more guts. Back there in the stands, Kakashi spoke to Naruto about Niji's history and tried to calm him down. 
Gara had a bloodthirsty look on his face, while Hei ate Jeko finally called for the match to begin. Hinata suddenly opened her Byakugan and took a stance. Meanwhile, stoic faced Niji just stood in the same way, apparently thinking that she wasn't even worthy for him to enter a stance, though he opened his Byakugan. Hinata didn't mind that and suddenly started running toward him to attack. However, just when she came near Niji, she suddenly saw a very large rotational blue force coming straight at her. Knocking her backward through the air, you're easy prey now. She heard a voice coming down below her next, you can't move now mid-air, double vacuum palms. Damn, Hanata's Byakugan converged on two different chakra waves, hitting her precisely, all over, and sealing nearly half of her chakra points and organs in an instant. She fell down on her head. Hanata, Naruto yelled hard from the stands, while Kurunai bit her lips hard in worry, preparing to intervene. And, seeing that she was still conscious, Niji added, you see now, not to mention defeating me. You can't even touch me. You're lucky that I didn't want to hurt you any further because I pity you. Judge, let's end this match. I don't have any more time to waste. And you blonde idiot up there, stop yelling already. Your squeaky voice is hurting my ears. You're the dumbest person I've ever seen in my entire life. Niji really hated loud things and stupid people the most. He truly disliked and even held a great deal of disgust toward Naruto. He wasn't pretending. He seriously meant that. However, as if some kind of god held grudge against him, he saw a limping Hanata in front coughing up blood and saying, Don't insult Naruto. Niji even laughed a little suddenly, seeing Hanata's weak voice defending him, and Niji's laughs at the injured Hanata. Naruto suddenly started shaking and leaking some Nine Tails chakra all of a sudden. This time he was truly angered. Hiruzen suddenly opened his eyes in shock, preparing himself to attack Naruto and stop the Nine Tails, while Orochimaru started dying of laughter internally from the scene. Haha, this Hayaga kid is so funny, maybe I could use him. Moreover, he mastered those two high-level Hayaga skills. At such a young age, he's a true prodigy. He could prove quite useful to me after Kimimuro dies in the future. Fortunately for Naruto, Kakashi quickly hit Naruto on the back of his neck, knocking him out before it got any worse. Everyone in the crowd had various degrees of reaction. Gara wanted to fight Niji right now and couldn't wait anymore. Sakura started worrying about Naruto, while Niji's team rejoiced. Immediately after noticing Naruto's strange reactions, Hayato called Niji as the winner. The next match was between Gara and Lee. However, before the fight started, Niji, as he also had a bit of goodwill toward Lee, reminded him that he should surrender right away. If his gates don't work on Gara, he explained that if got injured or disabled, he would then never be able to defeat himself. However, if he stayed safe, then he still had at least a theoretical chance after a few more decades. It was a crude method, but Mike Guy agreed with Niji while Lee started thinking about it. Haha, didn't expect you to care about me so much as well, Niji. Don't worry I agree with you. Lee suddenly held his thumb up with a weird gaze toward Niji. His personality was truly different now than in the original series. Due to all the talking guy and Niji did to him, he was now more realistic. The match then started after a while, and at first, none of Rock Lee's Tejutsu attacks managed to penetrate or circumvent Gara's shield of sand until Lee removed the weights he was wearing on his legs. The boost of speed was such that Gara's sand couldn't follow Lee's movements, and Gara was hit for the first time in his life. However, Gara was revealed to be using Armor of Sand to keep Lee's attacks from working on him. Realizing that his normal attacks will no longer work, Lee then used his front lotus on Gara. But in the end, it was revealed that it had been a sand clone. Having no other way to end the match, and with Guy's permission, Lee then opened five of the inner chakra gates. The result being that Lee's strength was multiplied immensely for a short time but also severely injured him. He then proceeded to continuously beat Gara with his reverse lotus. However, as Gara fell to the ground, he dispersed his sand gourd as a cushion to break his fall. Different than in the original series, at this time Rock Lee quickly surrendered, on time, so the nearby Jonin saved him from Gara's next merciless attack, that would have crushed his arm and leg. After Gara won, the next and final battle commenced between Choji and Dosu. Choji was reluctant to battle, instead wanting to forfeit, but tried after being promised food by his sensei, Asuma Saratobi, if he won. Choji entered the battle with prior knowledge of Dosu's sound-based attacks, and quickly used human bullet tank to plug his ears from the Oto Ninja's attacks, However, Dosu overcame this by transmitting his sound through the water in Choji's body, thus defeating him. After the preliminary ended, there was a drawing of lots to determine the first round matchups for the main tournament. There was a one-month period in which the remaining Genning could prepare themselves. Various important dignitaries would be also invited to watch those main matches. Many foreign shinobi, civilian watchers, and merchants were everywhere around the Konohagaka already. Today was one of the most important dates in the entire ninja world. Eventually, even those feudal lords, the daimyo, alongside their entourages in luxurious lineups came to the Kanoha. The big finals of this tune in exams 
were a significant event for the entire ninja world. Even some people from the countries that didn't participate in it came in to observe this time around. Every participating village wanted their shinobi to present their village in the best light later on the stage, for them to earn more missions in the future from their daimyo, and increase their reputation to all of the thousands of people that came in to watch from all around the ninja world. Somewhere inside a forest near the Kanoa's village entry walls, there was some kind of a large clear training ground Niji kind of created himself through his many years of continuous practice there. At first, it was also full of trees and other vegetation like the rest of the large forest. But due to his continuous training, it became like that. Niji chose this location as it was on the completely different side of Kanoa boundaries from the Hyuga clan's residence. So he doesn't have to worry about their spying eyes. Though, Niji made a secret personal trail to it all the way from the Hyuga compound, full circle around the Konohagaka. With his speed, it wasn't a problem for him to come every day to train. The forest was also full of different wild beasts Niji used to fight while he was younger. But now, any of those predators somehow sense his strength and avoid him in fear. Rotation. Niji's body suddenly spun rapidly as he expelled Chakra from all of his Tenketsu points at once. A familiar blue circle of Chakra suddenly formed all around him, being both a protective shield and a deflecting attack tool at the same time, again just 5 meters in length. It seems that for now I still simply don't have enough Chakra reserves for further range. My chakra control is not the problem. Niji repeated something that he already knew. That was because he was still just a 13 year old. And his body and chakra still weren't finished developing to their fullest potential. Hiyashi Hayega could for example form a rotation of somewhere around 10 meters in length. If he gave it his all in Niji's estimates. Niji, from the original could at best do just two and a half meters around this tune in exam's timeline. And it was not just rotation for Hiyashi. He could additionally perform all of the other Hayuga secret techniques in a much more superior way than Niji, due to his age, body, and chakra development. This was one of the ways how Niji deduced that his strength could have already been on the middle cage level based on everything that Niji saw from him so far. However, with this now, I should have reached Hiyashi's level already. Senjutsu, rotation. However this time, Niji's range extended all the way to 10 meters already, and the color it displayed was dark purple, almost black-like. A large hole in the ground formed all around Niji. He, if you draw in too much natural energy, or do it without supervision, you will die and turn into stone. But what if you expel it right away, at the moment you absorbed it too? Niji smirked. This was why Niji needed just a way to gather around natural energy, without planning to use it in the first place. He planned to expel it from his body as soon as his body absorbed it with rotation. To develop this move during the past month, Niji needed to only determine exactly how much natural energy was safe to absorb and use because he already had the best method to expel it. It was never stated in Naruto that you would die from absorbing natural energy. It was just stated that you would die from absorbing too much of it, or doing it irresponsibly. Therefore, during the past month, Niji spent countless hours just to figure out what exactly was this too much level. Eventually, after going through many methods, like doing it at significantly low speed, and then observing his body with his Byakugan's nearly microscopic internal vision, he caught on right after his first bunch of cells started slowly micro-deteriorating, and then he barred it from further damage. And, with that he finally discovered what was the maximum potential for this technique. Maybe Maybe with age, due to his body development and strengthening, he could double the range of it from 10 to 20 meters for example. However, 10 was the limit he was currently willing to go. Moreover, the range wasn't even the best part of this technique. Due to him expelling both his own chakra and natural energy toward his opponents, if hit multiple times, or at close distances, their bodies could even start deteriorating and turning into stone instead. And it also carried a stronger rotational force and defensive shield capabilities than an ordinary rotation due to natural energy being way more powerful and potent than ordinary bodily chakra. It was a true S-class technique. It was a pity he couldn't incorporate natural energy with his vacuum palms as well. But once he releases Orochimaru's Senjutsu from his stomach from his subconscious chakra control, it starts uncontrollably filling his whole body with natural energy. Not just his arms, and only whole body Hayuga techniques like the rotation could be used in harmony with it. It's way too dangerous otherwise, as the time required to bring the natural energy, potentially from his whole body to just his arms for vacuum palms, with chakra control, was too much and he would have probably turned to stone by then before he succeeded. The whole premise of this was that he needs to expel it all fast. I feel like with this, I could even stand on equal ground with Hiruzen, Hiyashi, and Danzo. There are not many opponents stronger than me currently left inside the village, maybe only Guy sensei and Jureya who was not in the village. He's late cage level at least. And with this finally over, I feel fully confident to pressure disabled Orochimaru later into giving me that thing to finally deal with my curse mark.
Niji's face turned extremely happy and confident, especially for those plans for later. But pity, I still didn't reach a truly microscopic level of vision required for that. It seems that I really must take a look at that forbidden scroll once Orochimaru bears his fangs at the village. After all, training more soul power should increase my vision to Jutsu's strength. Niji formulated more plans. Only Itachi Achiha should have been stronger than me at this age. Therefore, I must keep my abilities a top secret until I resolve the problem with the curse mark at least. Niji thought next. Niji suddenly looked at the changing sky. It seems that the finals are about to start soon. Let's meet with Tenten and them next. During the last month Niji also occasionally helped Tenten with her chakra control, paying her back for the time she was teaching him about Fuenjutsu in the past. He told her about many of his principles and showed her exercises. He formulated in the past regarding chakra control, so that she could use her pressure waves with more efficiency in the future, without passing out like that again so easily. He also complimented her many times on it. Niji first met with Tenten, Lee, and Guy in their usual meeting spot on one of Kanoa's rooftop terraces. Mike, Guy, and Lee would watch exams from the stands while he and Tenten fought. Niji, you finally arrived. We thought you were going to be late. Tenten joyfully exclaimed while Guy and Lee started rooting for them. Well, it's time, let's go. Niji just smiled and nodded. The finals of the Chunin exams are held inside the large Kanoa Stadium at the far left of the village. The Chunin exams arena was a large dome with patchy grass and a few trees and bushes. The areas that don't have grass on them seem to have a dry sandy color to them. On top of the dome were three buildings from where the audience usually watched the fights that took place. Tenten and Niji soon entered the large fighting stage down below with large cheers accompanying them from the crowd. After all, Niji was currently the number one star of this exam, unlike in the original universe where it was Sasuke. Niji, you're so popular, Tenten exclaimed all of a sudden while they were approaching other participants in the center of the field. No, I think they're cheering for you Tenten. Niji smiled. Tenten just stuck her tongue cutely to him as a response, and they slowly came near the others. The judge this time was Jem Mishiranui, as apparently, Hei Jeko was nowhere to be seen. Niji of course knew what happened to him, as it was quite a memorable scene from the original series, when he was caught spying on Baki, of the Sun Agaka, and Kabuto, and then Baki murdered him. Shino, Shikamaru, Kankuro, and Gaara were already all there. Naruto, Sasuke, and Dosu were missing, though Niji also already knew what happened to Dosu as well. He was killed off by Gara. Shikamaru was the only one to greet them to which Niji just nodded and found Gara looking at him madly. It appears that in this universe, he placed greater importance on him than on Sasuke. And, after a while, Naruto also came in a stupid and embarrassing way, like in the original to which Tenten beside Niji chuckled suddenly. He, Niji, you were right the last time. He is really stupid. Damn. Naruto hissed immediately and wanted to start arguing. But Genma told him to get his car together, and for them all to face the giant crowd next. The final round was finally about to begin. The Kazakiage of the Sunagaka village also came to the highest place to watch the competition, together with the Hokage, who now delivered a welcoming speech to all. They also allowed Sasuke to still participate if he came in before his exam started. Genma explained the rules to everyone, apparently. They still remained the same as in the preliminaries. Then only Naruto and Niji remained standing there as the first match belonged to them. Tenten giggled a little at Niji and went ahead. Hanata and Kiba came, at this time, to watch the battle together. Hanata clenched her fists while looking Looking at Naruto down below, Naruto, I believe in you, only you can defeat that person, comma. Apparently she still believed in Naruto's victory, even after her embarrassing defeat to Niji, one month ago, in a couple of seconds. It was the shortest fight in the entire Chunin exam's recorded history. After that, now her father and grandpa have even completely stopped speaking to her. The only positive thing left for her, at this moment, was her love and respect for Naruto and her team. Sakura and Ino were also sitting together in the crowd, but, apparently, Sakura forgot to even cheer for Naruto because of her worries for Sasuke, who didn't come, before Ino reminded her. Though both of them knew, that Naruto had zero chance of winning, having seen that all back in the forest, though not many people noticed them, there were now Anbu members hidden all over the crowd. Hiyashi, Hiroyoshi, and even the clan heiress Hanabi, were also watching the battle from the stands. Be careful not to miss any moments Hanabi. This is the biggest genius in our Hyuga clan's history. Down on the fighting ground, Naruto started shouting about something again. When Niji hinted at Genma to start the match quickly, as he hated seeing that ugly orange jacket and that stupid face. And at last, the fight started. Naruto immediately summoned a bunch of Shadow Clones Jutsu, avoiding first close combat with Niji, as it happened in the original. He has either gotten smarter or someone must have warned him in advance. But it doesn't matter, Niji opened his Byakugan. Dozen of Naruto's clones started getting closer to him. 
Therefore Niji just used an ordinary rotation move to destroy them all. And just when his rotation finished, he was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly he came right in front of the real Naruto. What? Naruto exclaimed in shock while Niji lightly double taped him with his palms, messing up nearly all of his internal organs right away. Niji realized who the real Naruto was just because of his perspirations and the speed of his beating heart. Niji, in this life, was now an expert in exploring physical characteristics more so than internal ones, like the internal chakra structure, which was comprehensively hidden by the shadow clones. Everyone in the crowd was amazed at how quickly Niji found out that the real Naruto out of them. Damn. Naruto slowly stood from the ground, ignoring all the pain and sickness he experienced due to internal organ damage. Your chakra pressure points are next. Niji, however, calmly stated. This time Naruto realized that he needed to use his clones both as shields and as a means of attack, so he summoned 500 of them this time around, depleting half of his chakra reserves then. Yeah, this time should be harder to find the real Naruto out, as I can't individually check on all of them. Niji suddenly thought, it was a great tactic for the current him, using his strengths to the maximum. Someone must have told him, or is he a little smarter here as this is the real world now? However, he's burning through his chakra reserves, while I'm just using my physical body to destroy them. He'll just get more time to stay in this match but he'll still eventually lose unless Kirama helps him. You're one trick pony. It's great luck that you're still alive with such a small toolbox. And just as Niji predicted, it took him a few minutes to destroy 80% of Naruto's clones and locate the real him again, now alongside his internal organs, sealing even most of his Tenketsu. He directly used 8 trigrams, 128 palms on the boy without resistance. Everyone in the crowd cheered for him while he was standing in front of Naruto's collapsed body. However, Niji still didn't believe that it was over, since Naruto still didn't tap onto Kurama's chakra. And he was right once again. Just as Genma wanted to announce him as the winner, Naruto suddenly stood up, with some kind of dangerous orange chakra swirling all around him. Naruto suddenly got at least 5 to 10 times more chakra than he had previously, when the match began. As for all the internal organ damage and sealed Tenketsu points, the Kurama's chakra fixed it all. Okay, this is probably the end since Hiruzen would probably stop the match if he accessed Kurama's chakra any further. Niji didn't panic, and when everyone in the crowd was still amazed by Naruto's state, he rushed right over at him, not wanting to allow him to drag it any longer by summoning more clones. And right while he was in the air, he used his fingers to manually open second gate. Naruto blabbered about something like in the original, and they clashed. However, this time, Niji got an upper hand, as it wasn't even the first Hell Beast transformation that Naruto used there. He launched an attack straight for Naruto's heart, though not too vicious, as there would still be a few plot points Naruto would have to reach later. Naruto reverted to normal and collapsed once more. Yeah, fate doesn't exist, or at least, it isn't set in stone. Right now I change my fate. Niji slowly murmured and smiled once he was called the winner by Gemma, and the whole stadium cheered. Amazing. The young Hanabi watched the whole fight with her Byakugan open, really broadening her horizons of what is possible with Hayuga's skills. Hiyashi and Hiroshi just sighed all of a sudden. Thankfully, they always had him under control due to that. Fate was sure cruel to him. He was clearly way more talented than Hanata, and also Hanabi. He was the most talented Hayuga ever but he was still just a servant due to the one second difference in birth between Hiyashi and his twin brother. Hanata's whole body was shaking while repeating Naruto's name, while Kiba attempted to console her. Sakura and Ino sighed as they expected such a result, and Guy and Lee jovially stood up and cheered for him. Hokage and Orochimaru also nodded a little in appreciation from the way up. Yeah, as expected of Niji. I can't wait to fight and win myself. Tenten thought full of fighting spirit. Gara barely contained his killing intent and started repeating something silently. Gara not now, please get it together, think about a plan. Tenten, Kankuro, and Baki immediately calmed him. The second match, which featured Sasuke versus Gara, was moved to be the last as Sasuke hadn't arrived yet. Normally he would have been disqualified on the spot, but his match had been highly anticipated, forcing the third Hokage to give in to the Kazakiyaj's request to postpone the match. The third match, which featured Shino versus Kankuro, was given to Shino on default, since Kankuro forfeited to keep his techniques a secret before their planned invasion was launched shortly after. The fourth match was Tenten versus Shikamaru, and surprisingly, as Naruto was in a coma, no one pushed Shikamaru down to the field to fight, so he forfeited, which made Tenten disappointed. However, somehow Sasuke and Kakashi still came on time, which made Niji think butterfly effect. Immediately after seeing them on the field, Niji suddenly informed Tenten beside him. I need to go to the toilet. Guy and Lee were somewhere down below to get a better look at this match. Niji, but why right before the match? Tenten looked at Niji's leaving back, 
and suddenly had a really bad feeling. From the beginning of the finals, there was an abnormal presence of Anbu there. Gara versus Sasuke finally came around. Sasuke demonstrated that his speed had vastly increased to the point where the sand guarding Gara could not keep up. Sasuke also demonstrated Chidori, a technique he had learned from Kakashi and Kakashi's only original technique to injure Gara. Before the match could finish, however, a smoke bomb was set off in the cage's box. Kabuto, who used the Jinjutsu to put almost everybody in the crowd to sleep, and the Kanova crush started. For years, Sanagaka suffered a series of budget cuts by the Daimyo of the Land of Wind, weakening the village, and thus rerouting ninja missions to Kanoha. One day, Orochimaru, a missing nin from Kanoha who founded a Togaka, approached the 4th Kazakij, with the proposition of a joint invasion, using the Chunin exams, making a Kanova crush plan hosted in Kanova as a cover to attack. Orochimaru, at some point, murdered the Kazakiage and assumed his identity on the day of the Chunin exam's final matches to make controlling Sunagaka easier. The attack was meant to be fought on two fronts. Sunagaka's Jinchuriki Gara would make it to the final rounds of the Chunin exams and release his tail beast Shukaku from the center of the village. While Kanoha was preoccupied with the one tail, Sunagaka and Atogaka forces would break through the walls surrounding the village. However, once Gara was injured by Sasuke Chiha during the finals, he was left mentally unsuited for fulfilling his role in the invasion. Therefore, Orochimaru's subordinate, Kabuto, instead cast the Temple of Nirvana technique on the stadium where the finals were being held, putting most present to sleep and signaling the invasion. The Kanoha ninja that were present and able to fend off the Jinjutsu, including most notably Mike Guy and Kakashi, immediately engaged the Oto ninja, that had earlier infiltrated the stadium, masking as ordinary spectators to protect the civilians present. Kabuto also then remained there. On Kanoha's outskirts, Suna and Oto Ninja, with help of some of Orochimaru's large snake summons, they prepared way earlier, punched holes in the village's defenses, eliminated the border guards, on the wall scouting outposts, and moved into the village outskirts. All combat-ready ninja of Kanoha nearby, immediately sought out the invaders to give the citizens time to escape to the safe area behind the Hokage Rock. Having taken the villagers by surprise the Suna and Oto, were able to claim some early victories, in part benefiting from the surprise of giant snakes rampaging throughout the village. Meanwhile, Baki, a son Jonin, informed Kankoro and Tamari to take Gara elsewhere to recover and proceed with the plan. Sasuke, confused about what is going on, follows the three, wanting to finish his fight with Gara and help the Kanoha. Kakashi noticed that Sakura too has managed to shake the Jinjutsu and told her to wake Naruto and Shikamaru so that they can follow Sasuke. She does so, though she finds that Shikamaru was also unaffected by the Jinjutsu, choosing to pretend as he had so that he could avoid being drawn into battle. To help in their pursuit of Sasuke, Kakashi summons Paken, Ninja Ninken to guide them, and the four set off. The fourth Kazakiage also held a kunai to the third Hokage's neck, making him hostage, and allowing them both to get to the roof of their sitting area without confrontation. As one group of Anbu members tried to come to the third's rescue, while the other protected the feudal lord, the Kazakiju's minions erected the four violet flames formation, preventing anyone from getting in or out. As the Kazakiju began to mock the third for getting so old and even going so far as to call him sensei, the third realized that the Kazakiju is actually Orochimaru in disguise, who sheds his disguise so that he can face his former master face to face. At that point Mike Guy and Kakashi couldn't intervene because they shielded the civilian crowd, and believed in the Hokage, is seen as how he easily let himself get restrained inside that barrier, probably wanting to fight with Orochimaru himself. Not like they could crack that barrier anyway. And now while everything was in chaos, Niji masked himself up, opened his Byakugan, and quietly left the hallways of the giant Kanoha fighting arena. He was going straight for the Hokage's residence at full speed, but from a roundabout way through a forest that encompassed the entirety of Kanoha, also his favorite place out of the whole village. He already had a route and a plan ready. He's going to employ all of this mayhem in order to achieve his objective. Though he was also aware that real Kanoha forces weren't deployed yet, as currently, they were all focused on getting women and children to safety in Kanoha's secret hideouts, before launching a counterattack of their own. That's why he's going to leave for the residence right after Kanoha's full forces go out as well. So, once he finally saw with Byakugan the tide of the battle slowly turning in Kanoha's favor, he launched himself fully for the Hokage's personal residence, where the Scroll of Seals should be. The Scroll of Seals was a scroll containing instructions about how to perform various dangerous jutsu. When certain types of jutsu were deemed forbidden following the end of the Warring States period, 
The first Hokage placed the information about these jutsu within the Scroll of Seals. The scrolls were subsequently stored at the Hokage residence, unavailable to be read by anyone but the Hokage. After a few minutes, Niji finally came in a range from which he could inspect the building, in question, with his Byakugan, weird only 10 embers are there. Did they not guard this place heavily at all while Hiruzen was not here? Or they left now to help with the invasion? Well, doesn't matter to me. Niji quickly analyzed 10 ordinary embers were something that he could deal with quite easily. The real problem is whether the Scroll of Seals has some kind of protective seal on its own as well. But judging from when Naruto took it back then, it shouldn't have. But no need to know, maybe it was purposefully lifted out for Naruto by Hiruzen, or they placed it later as a response after that. If it comes to that, then I'll simply take it for Orochimaru, and ask him to help me lift the seal, as I'm not especially good at Fuenjutsu. Niji thought about many variables as he suddenly sprinted for it. The Hokage residence was a large mansion occupied by the Hokage during their tenure, and is located close to both the Academy and Hokage Rock. Circular in design, it was also one of the largest buildings in Konohagaka, towering over most other buildings. There is also the kanji for fire painted on the roof of the building. Those ambu were all carefully hidden around the building. As Niji still didn't want to get discovered, he decided that after killing them, he would store their bodies inside of the scroll he prepared alongside the needed jutsu itself. It was a simple fuenjutsu. He came to their sensing range like lighting, in his second gate form, killing them decisively one by one before they managed to regroup, only to be destroyed by his new jutsu the senjutsu. Rotation, and the scroll of seals was later surprisingly easy to find with his Byakugan, with the ability to scan large areas, and especially suited for searches like this one, as it could help Niji see through walls. The scroll of seals was without a seal on its own, and the spirit transformation technique was there as Niji needed. It was truly easy, but, if they stationed more ambus there, it might have not been. He quickly copied just that specific technique, instead of stealing the whole thing to avoid inducing more wrath in Kanoha's elders, resulting in more searches later. Now was the most critical time of his plan, if he wanted freedom. At any rate, the remaining techniques were either all rubbish or simply useless to him. Therefore, he rationally calculated his risk-to-reward ratio while doing this move. He doesn't have high spatial affinity or years to learn the Flying Thunder God, like Minato. He didn't have any desire whatsoever for the Reaper Death Seal, Eight Gates, or the Edo Tensei, and they were the best techniques written there in Niji's opinion. However, it's not like he didn't desire to copy them in addition, just in case. But he didn't have the time now, as the fight between Orochimaru and Hiruzen could be over at any moment, and he needed to catch Orochimaru. Not to mention that the chances of him getting found out would be bigger with every second he remained there. Somewhere inside the big forest Niji, without a drop of blood on him, read the Jutsu's description with a wide grin, Jackpot, this method is perfect for cultivating spiritual power. Just as I suspected, the technique was an S rank class. And while the eight gates was the peak physical, this was the peak spiritual technique. It allows the user's spirit to leave their body. Versatile in application, this technique can be used in a variety of ways, depending on the user's intentions. By taking possession of a target, the spirit is able to suppress and collapse the victim's spirit, killing them. Should the user intend to, possessing a victim can instead enable the former to freely manipulate their actions. This technique enables the user's consciousness to exit their physical form. Its adaptability makes it suitable for a wide range of purposes, depending on the user's objectives. By inhabiting a target, the user can subdue and extinguish the victim's essence resulting in their demise. However, if the user wishes, they can commandeer the victim's body to manipulate their actions. It's time to meet that man Orochimaru. I feel like my freedom, at last isn't far away. Niji laughed once he ran back, preparing to ambush Orochimaru and his team, while the man was weakened. Once Kanoha finally launched a counter-attack against the invading forces and turned the tide of the battle, Solving all of the remaining invaders slowly and assessing the damage, no one noticed a shadow quietly leaving the village walls chasing after the mastermind of this whole failed invasion. Orochimaru was currently held by two of his Atogaka subordinates. He brought along to erect the barrier, preventing anyone from intervening while he assassinated Hiruzen, though the plan failed. Kabuto also joined them after a while, successfully escaping with the Sunagaka's Joan and Baki, from Kakashi and Mike Guy before they parted ways. Two more of Atogaka's ninja were also present. They hastily jumped on tree branches of this dense forest, while running expeditiously right to their secret hideout base, located somewhere in the Land of Sound. All of their expressions were solemn due to Orochimaru's present state, and no one dared to speak much, not even Kabuto. Orochimaru was strangely quiet during this time, 
thinking about everything with a grim and angry expression. I truly didn't expect that old man to learn that seal. Not to mention humiliate me like that and die with a smile on his damn old face. Orochimaru gritted his teeth. It didn't go in any way he planned it to go. Additionally, he didn't even manage to get Sasuke. His whole trip to Kanoha was a failure. Orochimaru was an orphan who became a pupil of Hiruzen Saratobi alongside Jiraiya and Tsunade. Compared to the more laid-back Jiraiya, Orochimaru stood out as a genius, his talents, insight, and determination were considered by Hiruzen to be that of a prodigy seen only once in a generation. After losing his parents in a war Orochimaru found a white snake near his parents' grave, with Hiruzen's explanation of it representing fortune and rebirth, inspiring Orochimaru to study Kenjutsu and obtain knowledge of all techniques. Later, after even his young disciple Naoki, Tsunade's brother, died on a mission, Having experienced the fragility of life, he now wanted immortality. This led him to eventually start experimenting on various people, some being fellow Konoha shinobi he kidnapped. He used them as human guinea pigs to develop techniques that would grant him immortality, the end result being living corpse reincarnation. He also worked with Hashirama Senja's DNA, experimenting on 60 children he kidnapped to recreate the first wood release, having help from Danzo. Later, Hiruzen finally couldn't take it anymore and decided to exile him. For most of his exile, he could just hide from the Kanoha. However, after he found the Atogaka and started training disciples, he knew that his forces would eventually grow so large, that he couldn't effectively hide from the Kanoha anymore, and that the Kanoha considered him so dangerous, that they would eventually attack him. So, he attacked them first, at a time when he thought he was powerful enough to win, and before the Kanoha were prepared to defend against him. He also needed a powerful vessel, for his technique with Keke Genkai, to last for a lifetime, not like the previous garbage vessels, which could only last for three years at most. He needed preferably an actual living Echiha with Sharingan, and the only surviving one like that was there. The living corpse reincarnation immortalizes one's mind, transferring it to a stronger body before the current host rots. It was developed in order to fuel his dream of acquiring all the knowledge in existence, a feat that cannot be achieved in a single lifetime. That was also his attempt at immortality. He also held a great deal of hatred for Hiruzen and the entire Konohagaka, because they didn't select him as the Hokage, instead of Minato, and then force him into exile, after he started performing more and more experiments on people out of anger. So, he had a desire for killing Hiruzen and destroying Konoha for a very long time. Not because of the Hokage's position itself, but because they rejected him. At that time he planned to use his position as the Hokage to learn many different forbidden techniques from there. Though later he realized that those techniques were nothing much, and that he would have just wasted his time there had he truly became the Hokage. But his thirst for revenge never went away, and he finally acted on it, but ultimately failed. He was also unusually bored during the past few years, so he really wanted to get the windmill of life moving again. There was too much peace recently in the ninja world, and that annoyed him. But, how did it end up like this? Orochimaru sighed once he took a look at his now black arms. Though, he didn't get into depression just because he couldn't perform some jutsu. And not like there weren't already many fixes for it. It's just that the pain was a little uncomfortable even for him. Using the dead demon consuming seal, Hiruzen was able to seal away the portion of his soul that resided within his arms. His arms were now paralyzed, suffered necrosis, and he couldn't use most of his jutsu. He was left only with the techniques that he could use without the use of hand seals. Oh, this is certainly interesting. Let's stop and wait for our little friend. Orochimaru licked his lips a little, his personality suddenly shifting back all of a sudden, returning to his usual confident one. What is going on, Lord Orochimaru? Who is there? Everyone suddenly stopped and Kabuto asked Orochimaru, with a serious face, while the other sound four also turned serious and apprehensive. They all stood in front of some kind of a small river inside the forest prepared to fight. Don't worry, it's nothing serious. Just some brat from the Hayuga clan. Orochimaru licked his lips a little. He noticed Niji Hayuga approaching them quicker than the rest of them because of his Senjutsu chakra. What? Is he crazy? Kabuto also remembered who Niji was from the Chunin exams. He was especially strong and talented for his age. However, why was he following them all of a sudden, does he have a death wish? Sound 4 on the side also snickered a little, preparing to murder. Even the rest of Kanoha didn't have the guts to chase them now, not to mention just one little kid. Just as Orochimaru predicted, they soon spotted a teenager in a white kimono, with scattered long black hair and white eyes slowly approaching them from the nearby trees, with a smile on his face. You all protect Lord Orochimaru. I will deal with him alone. Kabuto immediately drew out his scalpel weapon, while the sound four quickly engaged in a battle stance around Orochimaru. Niji now stood 20 to 30 meters away from them all, and slowly opened his mouth, and spoke in a calm tone, Stop that. I didn't come to fight. I have something to talk about with Orochimaru. Orochimaru smiled in response to Niji, 
While Kabuto turned a little angry, that's Lord Orochimaru for you kid. And what have you possibly to talk to him about? I'm worried that I have to inform you of your death now. They certainly didn't have any time for conversations now, when Kanoha's shinobi could come after them at any moment. However, before Kabuto could recklessly proceed to attack Niji, Orochimaru stopped him promptly. Stop it, Kabuto. What are you doing? You're not his match. What do you desire, Niji? Is it about that curse mark on your forehead? I can try and solve it for you. But only if you become my subordinate, Orochimaru grinned as he analyzed Niji. Orochimaru, you're wrong. I don't need your help with the curse mark. I came for something else. I came in to propose a plan for equal cooperation between us. Niji calmly answered in a confident tone. Now realizing that with Orochimaru's arrogant personality, they would indeed need to clash first in some form or another, before they could negotiate on equal terms. But, he didn't care much. You new generation kids are indeed too cocky. You should know your limits. I gave you the chance to resolve your insolent behavior of stopping us peacefully, but you didn't cherish it. Orochimaru's face turned a little displeased again, and his whole entourage suddenly got angry as well. Not one of them was previously recruited in this way. Orochimaru was giving him surprisingly a lot of care. Kabuto, Kitamaru, Teiaya, you bring him down first. I'm going to plant him with my curse mark. You two, Seiken Yukon, and Jirobo remain near me just in case. Orochimaru licked his lips and ordered. Kimimura was near the end of his life, and he needed a new subordinate of that caliber. He couldn't use Niji as his next vessel because of his Hyuga clan slave seal. Just like he couldn't use Kamimura as a vessel, either due to his strange illness. But, as subordinates, they could still be of use. Moreover, he also always had a nagging feeling that Niji was hiding something really important. So, he still gave Niji a chance to live after this. However, his treatment would be much crueler one. He was nearly out of chakra due to his previous difficult battle against Hiruzen. So he left those two near him, just in case a sudden sneak attack if some sort from other people of Kanoha came at him. He still didn't rule out but that the boy in front of him also worked work on their orders. Moreover, felt like the team of those three could easily solve him, no matter how talented he was. Well, it's even better for me in this way to not come at me all at once. After I reduce their number this way, I'll even have more leverage in this conversation. Niji's face remained calm and collected. He also quickly went over all the information he could remember inside his mind about the two sound four members in Kabuto. They could theoretically pose a challenge to him together as Kabuto was an elite jonin level ninja while the other two were at least low jonin. However, he knew a lot about their abilities, while also possessing ace in whole techniques they knew nothing about. The Sound Four were originally prisoners of Orochimaru, forced to fight other prisoners to the death in battle royals. By surviving their respective matches, they proved themselves to be the strongest of Orochimaru's prisoners, and as such, they were given curse marks, and made his bodyguards. They all wore Otogaka's protectors in various places on their bodies and were dressed in similar attires as Orochimaru with thick rope belts and kimonos. Both Seiken and Juken had fair skin and straight, dark blue hair with long bangs, that covered each different eye. They both wore a green shade of lipstick, and had dark markings around their eyes, giving them an androgynous appearance. As Yukin usually slept inside Seiken's body, his head protruded from the back of Seiken's upper back and hung limply, making his hair cover his face. Being the tallest member of Sound 4, Jirobo was a large and imposing young man, towering over the rest of his teammates. He had fair skin and narrowed slanted orange eyes. He had three tufts of orange hair on his head, a mohawk of sorts that ran down the middle, and two similarly styled tufts of hair at the side. He was also considered to be the weakest out of the Sound 4. Kitamaru was a dark-skinned shinobi with black, shaggy hair tied into a ponytail and black eyes. He was the second tallest member of the team and with a confident grin on his face. Uniquely, Kitamaru also had six arms and an eye on his forehead that was usually closed and concealed. And finally, Teiaya was a fair-skinned girl with a slender build and was the shortest member of the sound fall. She had brown eyes that were accentuated by her eyelashes extending into the corners of her eyes, and was usually sporting an impassive expression on her face. Teia's most distinctive feature was her long, untamed, dark pink hair that fell past her shoulders with long parted bangs framing either side of her face, and one between her eyes. Her curse seal is applied on the back of her neck, where it is in a circular pattern of three hooks, similar to a Triskelion, concealed by her hair. Then come at me, Orochimaru's minions. Niji opened his Byakugan and readied himself to battle. Kabuto smiled arrogantly as he took some kind of personal strength boosting pill, after whispering something quickly to Kitamaru and Teiaya. His hands also started glowing blue in a sharp way. Usually everyone should avoid close combat with you Hyugas, but not me. I'm a medical specialist and know everything about your clan. Kabuto smiled all of a sudden while preparing to launch. Moreover, I have Teiaya and Kitamaru to keep you busy. I just need one good sneak attack done. He, let's see your level brat. 
Are you a small or a big fry? Kitamaru already activated the first stage of his curse mark, his whole body now covered in black marks. He then bit his finger and immediately summoned a giant spider Kardagumo. It was a gigantic black spider with orange stripes going down the back of its abdomen. It greatly resembled a tarantula. It immediately climbed higher to the top of the nearby giant-sized trees, and creepily came directly above Niji. You bastard, how dare you even think about talking with Lord Orochimaru. Teia also immediately entered her first stage of the curse mark picking up her special flute next, and then called on her own summoning Doki. They were three eerie-looking large and muscular beings. Their eyes and ears are covered, and their mouths are sewn shut. By playing specific melodies on her demonic flute, Teia could control them, each melody causing them to perform different actions. Usually, those Sound 4 ninja are way more playful and cocky in their personalities. However, with Orochimaru now beside them, they didn't dare to mess around. They turned serious from the start. This is really interesting. Are all of those three being created using your yin release? Are all products of your imagination? Niji turned a little interested all of a sudden. First time seeing a jutsu like this one ever since he came into this world. And he was always deeply obsessed with all kinds of soul-related things. Her chakra is also really interesting, very mysterious and different. The other spider guy was unique in his own right, but not much interesting to Niji as Teia. Although he also probably used Jang release for his various spider web and other bodily fluid creations. Tei also had a very powerful sound-based flute Jinjutsu that affected her opponents directly. Although Niji could expel all of the harmful chakra from his mind by releasing Tenketsu points. Both normal and sound-based Jinjutsu were pretty much useless to Niji due to his great chakra control. Jinjutsu could work even on less skilled Hayuga but not on him by any means. A Jinjutsu is created when a ninja controls the chakra flow of a target's cerebral nervous system, thereby affecting their five senses. This is frequently used to create false images, and or trick the body into believing it has experienced physical pain. It was entirely Yin Release's field of study. How does he even know about Yin Release already? Interesting. This might be a really interesting meeting comma. Orochimaru suddenly licked his lips a little curiously, while Teia opened her eyes wide. It was the first time someone guessed that her doki were created using the Yin Release, not to mention realizing that right the moment he first saw them. Even her team currently doesn't know that information. Only Lord Orochimaru knew about it. Having recommended her to venture onto that path himself, she was always very talented in the yin release from the moment of her birth. Nonetheless, in the next moment, a hand signal came from Kabuto, so she immediately started performing her melody and directing her beasts to attack Niji, now having a bit more respect for him. Kitamaru also snickered and quickly started forming his special spider web from his mouth. Kabuto should have a pretty good body speed, as he managed to keep up with Tsunade in the original. Moreover, since they respected me so much, it's just right to start with the second gate. I have a limit of 5 minutes to end these three. Everyone looked in surprise as Niji's body started oddly emitting chakra. After this, he promptly collided with one of the giants, gentle fist is useless against those mindless giants. Then Kabuto, you mentioned medical ninjutsu, so how do you like my enhanced chakra scalp? Right at that moment Niji's big chakra scalpel swiftly cut down both the upcoming chakra webs from Kitamaru's direction and the head of one of Tei's humanoids. Ho ho, Orochimaru murmured a little while Kabuto opened his eyes wide in shock and even checked his glasses. This level of chakra control, it's simply unheard of. This Hayuga what a freak. Kabuto, you should realize now why I sent those two, especially alongside you. Yes, your chakra control is truly subpar in comparison to that boy. Only long range opponents can trouble him. Come back now. This was to teach you not to be so overconfident in the future. Jirobo, you take his place, remember do only long range attacks. Orochimaru knew of Niji's chakra control, ever since he saw him contain his Senjutsu chakra, without much effort, back at the Kanoa's tune in Exams Arena. Kabuto was simply of no use against him, and not only Kabuto, the strongest of the Sound Forsaken was also useless as well. Their styles were simply countered by Niji comprehensively. Kabuto was a war orphan who lost his memory from when he was a child during the Third Great Shinobi War, ending up getting rescued by Nono Yakushi who brought him to Kenova's orphanage, named him, giving him his favorite glasses and sight, and then becoming like his second mother. They worked together for Root and Danzo, as Nono was previously also a professional spy for the Root, and they needed to gather enough money for the orphanage, since Danzo blackmailed them, that he would cut out Kenova's funding. But, they were later betrayed by Danzo because he thought that they got to know too much sensitive information about their operations at all of the big villages from their missions to be kept alive in the future, so he wanted to dispose of them. Nono got killed in Danzo's scheme by Kabuto, while Kabuto himself survived, but without a purpose once again starting from a clean slate just like at that time. He was a child who wondered about his purpose. And just then, Orochimaru appeared and recruited him to the Atogaka, 
giving him a new purpose in life and a sense of belonging, also explaining to him everything about Danzo's plot. Yes, Lord Orochimaru. Kabuto gritted his teeth and dejectedly came beside Orochimaru to guard him instead of Jurobo. It was the first time today that he met someone with a more proficient chakra control, and by such a larger margin for that matter. He didn't even think it to be possible before. His mood turned grim all of a sudden to be humiliated like that in front of Lord Orochimaru, comma. However, in fact, he couldn't be blamed. He was just an ordinary person, while Niji's current soul was manifested by a fusion of two different souls, while he was just three years old, and it grew ever since, while Niji trained in Hyuga techniques, trained his Byakugan, and got more knowledge and will. It was not about pure chakra control anymore, Niji's whole spiritual power was way superior. Jirobo immediately lifted a giant piece of earth and threw it toward Niji, after also releasing his stage of curse mark, while, at the same time, Teia's giant's head regenerated weirdly. So it's truly just a piece of her imagination. Then it's useless attacking them. I must attack and finish her first. Hey Jibra you idiot, you destroyed the trees my Kardagumo was latched onto, damn. Kitamaru cursed a little. However, the giant spider quickly spew out a large amount of sticky web and stabilized itself again. Niji now had to worry about the giant rock coming ahead, the spider above, and the three humanoids behind him. Moreover, none of them even opened their second stages of Kursk marks until now. It was a challenge for even cage level shinobi to best them in combination. Rotation. Niji quickly used his usual rotation, destroying the upcoming earth boulder and knocking those giants backward. However, right then he noticed a rain of small spiders above him. Kitamaru smiled as he quickly cut the belly of the giant spider, with his golden substance spear, rain of spiders. The many baby spiders rained down on Niji spinning out strings of chakra as they fell. Meanwhile, Teya started playing a different melody, as her giants suddenly opened their mouths, causing many mouth, worm-like spirits made of chakra to emerge from there. The chakra of the spirits is almost entirely spiritual energy, causing them to ravenously seek out physical energy in order to achieve balance. Teia's melody directed the spirits at Niji in so complicated a pattern as to resemble dancing. Because of their immaterial form, the spirits are impervious to direct attack. This attack is really dangerous. Even if I get hit by it, I would be in danger. Truly extraordinary. Niji looked at those dancing worm-like spirits. He was again amazed by Teia's odd abilities today. Niji turned back, and hit those two giants with many of his vacuum palms, forcing them backward and nearly destroying them those strange attacks vanishing from their mouths, so until they regenerate again, she can't use her strange spiritual worms, it's good. Once the three humanoids were knocked down, Niji then used his defensive eight trigrams, 128 palms on the spiders that fell from the above. He formed an imaginary area around himself and destroyed those spiders mercilessly like a machine gun, all the while also cutting all of their sticky chakra webs. That touched him. After 10 seconds, all of them were destroyed and Tei's beast regenerated. However, unlike in the original universe, this time Kitamaru didn't manage to find Byakugan's blind spot as Niji's both attack and movement speed of vision were much faster than during that time. Damn, this guy is on a different level. Kitamaru thought as he directed his giant spider to fall onto Niji next. Jirobo launched a huge earth boulder at him again, but this time a much larger one than the previous time, and Tei's many spirits sought to feast on Niji's physical energy once again. Orochimaru watched all of this with interest while Kabuto and Seiken and Yukin turned unsettled. The giant spider and the three humanoids and now all in range, should I end this for good? Yes, after all, only in this way will I prove to be a worthy partner for Orochimaru. Senjutsu. Rotation. What? My Senjutsu chakra is now being freed from his chakra control. Orochimaru suddenly sensed something and opened his eyes wide in amazement, now carefully inspecting Niji's body. Yes, he's absorbing it now, but for what? I will finally find out. This is a fascinating moment, his Kitamaru, Teia, Jirobo. Seiken, Yukin, Kabuto, and Orochimaru looked thunderstruck as a giant sphere of dark purple rotational force suddenly emerged out of Niji's body, knocking out Kitamaru's giant spider, Teia's humanoid giants, and Jirobo's boulder meters away from him at the same time. And not only that, they slowly looked in fright as they suddenly started turning into stone and crumbling. I understand, haha. Orochimaru suddenly began shouting in a revelation. Kitamaru, Jirobo, and Teia immediately went back in an attempt to guard Orochimaru who now had a nearly mad grin on his snake-like face, and spoke, you're truly a genius, Niji Hayuga, who was the first Hayuga in history to think of this kind of attack. Yes, you don't need a method for storing and using that natural energy that you gather with the help of my Sanjusta Chakra. You just need to rapidly expel it by merging it with your ordinary Hayuga gentle fist rotation. It is a marvelous move. Great job. Moreover, you can open up to the fourth inner gate and use another high-level move you created. You're a genius nearly on the level of Itachi Ichiha, and the most creative Hayuga in history. Orochimaru continued praising Niji and licking his lips. 
He always had his channel of spies in Kanoha, therefore obviously he also already knew about Niji's clash with those samurai bandits. Everyone, don't open your second forms, the fight is over. Sound 4 members who just now wanted to open their second stages of the curse mark suddenly opened their eyes wide in shock, will Lord Orochimaru really treat this kid as his equal? But, he's kind of strong, comma, Taya I thought. Orochimaru presently realized that with the Sound 4 in Kabuto, the chances of them winning were at most 50-50. Moreover, Niji could escape whenever he wanted with his fourth gate, so there was no point in engaging in a pointless battle, as Kanoha could still come at any moment. However, the biggest reason he wanted to peacefully talk with Niji next, was that he had a sudden throbbing in his heart, having a feeling that he would learn some truly earth-shattering information. Well, this is for the best. Niji breathed in relief and turned off his second gate form promptly. He knew that both Teiya and Kitameru hadn't used their strongest attacks yet, and his primary objective today was not to fight with Orochimaru and his gang, but to obtain those precious things. And that's the end of this episode. The series will continue in the next part. So be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, share, and comment down below. This really helps with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching, we'll be seeing you in the next part. Check out my other anime videos.